So tools are going to be things that you're going to utilize a lot for the making season. So what are those tools? Well, for me, it's paper trimmers, right? Because I'm going to want to do, I don't know, cards, tags, anything like that. Those are things that are really going to help me out. And I think having some tools, um, I like a regular paper trimmer, I like a decal trimmer. Having those tools I think are going to be important. This is going to allow you to prep a lot of different things, okay? A lot of things like your cardstock for cards or your tags or whatever those things are. If you work on regular size cardstock, eight and a half by 11, uh, this trimmer is going to be perfect because this will allow you to uh, easily quarter cut a piece of cardstock, right? So I'll just take a piece of watercolor, right? So I have a lot of surfaces out too, and we're gonna talk surfaces because I think that that's, that's super important, okay? But the cool thing about like this particular tonic trimmer is it's got these little dotted lines, these little dashes. These are uh, really important for quarter cutting uh, eight and a half by 11 cardstock for your four and a quarter by five and a half card front. So first you're gonna do uh, your first cut your first cut, you're pretty much gonna work from the outside in. So your first cut, first line, and your paper only fits in one way. This can't fit in this way, it's too tall, right? So you're just gonna slide this in, go to your first dash, your first dotted line, index finger, thumb, because you wanna hold down that paper guide to make sure your paper doesn't shift when you cut, when you use a guillotine trimmer, okay? Right, first line, cut, turn it, right? Second line, Talking about that, that dash, that dotted line, that's gonna be four and a quarter. Done, take that, done, okay? And what that does is that easily and quickly quarter cuts your cardstock. So you can sit there, you know, watching TV, whatever, and just quarter cutting a bunch of card panels. I do this for uh, a great way to start backgrounds because it doesn't have to be that finished size. This could be something uh, that's easy to do backgrounds that you can die cut, that you can do anything like that just to prep Things so you already have it done. So these are ideas that you can do throughout your every day, right? Not that you have to sit there and, and get out and do all the crafting stuff, but you need to prep some cardstock. So maybe it's gonna be watercolor, craft, whatever that is. If you have things that are already done or backgrounds, and when you go and do cards, the decal trimmer is awesome. It's just one of my favorites because it has that decal blade. Uh, remember that the decal is very organic. It starts smoother and it goes chunkier. So you don't always have to start at the top. If you start at the very top of the blade, it is going to give you uh, much more of a smooth decal to start. Some people actually don't like this. I happen to like this because if I'm cutting smaller things like smaller photo booth photos, right? I want more of a, a subtle decal than a jaggedy decal. So I like that little bit, especially if I'm doing little photos like Ideology Photo Booth, I can get a much more subtle decal by sitting at the top. But if you have just a regular card or tag, you can go anywhere on here because this grid is going to allow you just to line up your card. So you don't always have to put it to the top or the bottom. Just line that up. And again, this guide not only protects your fingers from going under the blade, but that is what holds your paper in place. And then you can just go in and cut. And then you get a nice decal edge. This is really cool because you can cut this. You can go over this with your ink blending. You can take a metallic if you have a metallic paint pen. You can do adhesive and do a mink. There's a lot of cool things you can do. But the decal trimmer is just a great touch for your holiday makes, right? Even if it's a store-bought card, you could take that store-bought card, open the card, and just decal the, the bottom lip or reveal of a card. Just a, a cool trimmer. If you're working with larger papers, right? Maybe you're, you're working with 12 by 12. You're gonna probably want uh, a larger paper trimmer. Nice guillotine. You can go in and cut your 12 by 12. I'll be honest, I don't work much with large sheets of paper, but if you're doing things, um, you know, different scrapbook layouts or you wanna cut bigger things for uh, maybe even an art journal, a large guillotine trimmer is going to be uh, your friend. But what I always feel for the holidays is that having the right tool for the convenient makes is key. So. We're gonna to start today's holiday demo with, well, a brand new release, a new release that is shipping today, right now. And it may not be new, new to everybody, but this is something that when I started with Tonic, they used to make and I loved it and they retired it. And I said, you really, really need to bring it back. And that would be this guy, the mini Aww, trimmer. So now, the cool thing about the mini trimmer for me, oh, I see that mini trimmer for the win. Nice, Mario. The, the mini trimmer is a tiny little trimmer. And this little guy, as you can see, compared to the regular 
tonic trimmer is much smaller, significantly smaller. This is a little six and a quarter. So let me get this out of the way. There we go right here. You can see kind of the, the size comparison. This is a six and a quarter mini trimmer. Like I said, you may have seen this. You may even have one of these already because it, it's been around in the marketplace for years, but, but it has retired, come, go, come, go. And I'm like, I really want this for uh, the line. I didn't think it was going to make it for the holiday season. This was gonna be something that we plan on releasing next year, but it arrived and thankful to Tonic that they're like, it's here, let's ship it out, let's go. So I love the fact that uh, it's perfect for holiday mix because I like the idea of having something small that I can keep on my workspace. Because like I said, if all of my cardstock is already pre-cut, whether it's quarter cut or whatever that is, I don't necessarily need to keep these trimmers out in my workspace. There's not gonna be a need to have it. This is just something that I can keep. I can throw it in my cart. It's very, very small. And it does allow me to do small trims, right? It's still a guillotine. Now, the thing to know about this one, this one has a latch and I'll show you that. You gently pull this out to go right over that bump. You see that little bump right there? That's a little safety latch. So it will stop when you go and cut because uh, when you do the guillotine, once the blades pass, it's done cutting. You don't have to like always touch to the bottom. So once it kind of hits that stop, it's done. But if you are going to travel or you want to uh, take it with you and you're going to do little trims, all you do is simply like push out on it and it will lock under there. So that will keep the blade from opening. Again, this is really designed more for uh, portability. It is designed mostly for small things. Uh, this was originally designed as a photo trimmer right? It was specifically for a small photo. So if you do a lot of December daily or you're doing uh, like Heidi Swap does her persnickety prints, you know, taking, taking that and having a small trimmer to do cuts and it cuts like a dream. Super sharp because it is that, that guillotine cutter. So this will go right through watercolor cardstock. But what I like is that we can easily prep different papers. And that's what we'll talk about as well, because in addition to uh, small cutters, Maybe a small die cut machine. I love my Sidekick. I'll use my Sidekick all season long. It also kind of stays with me because I'll be able to, to set up a workstation. So really what I do, let me move this out, grab my media mat, there we go. This guy, haha. <laughs> so I work on my media mat a lot. This is a very portable uh, place for me to work. So I'll take my Sidekick. Usually I'll take just a little bit of water. I'll kind of put it over here in my uh, on my media mat, just a little spritz of water. I find that water makes the suction part uh, actually last longer. You don't have to use it. You don't have to use water, but if you do a little bit of water, that really makes the suction of this super strong and it tends to stay on for weeks, right? Because usually if you, if you don't do that, you come back the next day, you have to just redo the lever. It just has a little, let me take this off, that little suction lever. It's not a big deal, but that's just a little tip if you're gonna set up your, your station. Right, so you'll have that there. Then let's say we wanna prep some paper. So that's gonna be the first thing. So the first thing I'll take out like basket number one, if you will, is all about uh, different things that I want to prepare for the making season. Maybe that's a bunch of backgrounds that I've done. So these are the Distress Storage Tin. This is for the crayons. So it's called the Distress Storage Tin. It fits a lot of things, crayons, embossing glaze jars. Um, and I've talked about this many times. So these are tags that I've done throughout any demos, right? Background, some stuff is finished ideas, some stuff isn't, it doesn't matter. If there's something that I could cut out or maybe use uh, as a finish tag, this was a collage that we did. I think this one was like, yeah, there you go. That was when we were doing the mica stain. I have that stuff in here because it's just at the ready. One, if I need a quick tag, there it is. If I wanna die cut this or, or maybe turn this into a card, right? I can chop off the front and I'm ready to go. So those are in here. So the great thing, let's just say I have, uh, we'll, take, we'll take this background, a nice holly, okay? I have those backgrounds. Another one I have is what I consider like almost card front backgrounds. Now, although I probably uh, end up cutting this into more of a collage, I have some card front backgrounds, right? So these are more of that four and a quarter, five and a half, like the moon mask, just things that we can go through and you can still die cut other elements. Maybe you're gonna do fall leaves. Maybe you just need a quick background. This is great because by having these tins ready, it allows you to really kind of come 
compartmentalize your making season. Maybe you're just in the mood to do backgrounds. Great, fill up your tin with inky backgrounds. Then you have them whenever you wanna go in and start cutting or making things. I'm gonna take out a couple backgrounds. I like some of this other grungy stuff back here, right? That's gonna be a good background. All right, so I have a, a tin of that. So, so far I've got tags and backgrounds. I have some alcohol ink stuff. I usually keep my alcohol ink background separate because, well, I just think it has a different look and feel, but you do you. If you wanna have stuff uh, all mixed up, that's fine. But this is all like Yupo backgrounds that I might wanna use, just pretty stuff that I've played around with. And again, nothing has to be finished, but like right there, boom, card. Ooh, here's another one, card. That was just from, again, a previous demo. I'll use it as a card front. The back part, and again, these are all the same tins. I just like having stuff in tins with a window because I can see through them. You are gonna see that these kind of tins are your friend because you can see what's inside. These are all the little bits that I've maybe altered, right? So maybe they are impresslets that you've already gone in and embossed, inked, done crayons, just doing paper embellishments. This is really key as well. If you wanna sit there one night and just go ahead and do a lot of uh, embossing or cutting, then you can spend an, the next day or the next evening inking, glazing, doing things. You'll have a bunch of embellishments that you could then throw on a quick card. Right, whether it's a frame, whether they're leaves, uh, even if you wanted to play around, like this was one of the demos of using uh, the ideology of baseboard windows. But these are all what I consider paper embellishments. Things that I might want a piece of trim for a card, right? Or I might wanna add some leaves or whatever it happens to be, you just have a tin of stuff already. And this, this is a great way to actually utilize your time when you don't have the desire to actually finish anything. We've all been there as makers, where you don't necessarily wanna make anything finished because you just don't have that much uh, creative energy, you're just not that inspired, but you can sit there and, and die cut or add inks. So one, of that, one part of the process also, I have another tin of just stuff to be altered, right? There are days that I don't even feel like getting out my inks, if you can believe that. It doesn't happen very often. Usually I'd rather ink than anything else, but I have no problem just taking cardstock and start embossing, embossing different substrates. It doesn't always have to be the same, right? Play around with different papers. Maybe I'll use my impresslets. And then I have those in a tin as well. So if I'm in my inking mode, maybe I'm doing backgrounds. I can take out some of these and create some paper embellishments simultaneously. So I do compartmentalize the way I think and make. But this little tip, this one is really, really important. And I know that there's many makers out there. I know Sharon has shared this, Keisha. There's a lot of makers uh, that, that talk about this as well. And I figured today I would just show you specifically maybe like what we're talking about. So I like that in a basket like this, I can fit six tins, right? And each one, I love that I can just look right through the window and identify what's in there, okay? So for this, let me move this out of the way. There you go. So for this one, this contains cardstock that is already cut, ready to die cut, or ready to stamp and cut out, whatever, that already has adhesive. Now I have different cardstocks. I have not only uh, solid cardstock, but I have metallic cardstock. And this was all stuff that we prepped for the season. If you have just scraps, it's a great way that you can use uh, scraps for that. You can also do any inky backgrounds, again, pre-adhesive. This way, especially if you're doing things like colorize or whatever, it is ready to go. You can sort them just by throwing them in a tin like this. You can put them in rainbow order. It only looks nice right now because we just filled it, but it's gonna get pretty, it's gonna get pretty messy through the season. So here's what we did to prep. First of all, you need to find the paper that you wanna work with. That's as simple as that as a maker. You wanna, whether they're gonna be background. So let's say we wanna do this and I wanna do a background. Okay, I'll just take this and we'll cut this in half, okay? I like the fact that I can take my backgrounds and decide, yep, yeah, I wanna just cut them. I think I'll cut this for a collage card. Great. This could be a card front. It doesn't matter that the image is cut off. This could be another one. Maybe I'm gonna use a decal trimmer. Maybe I'm gonna tear the edge. So there's a lot of things that could be fragmented ideas that you had that can actually turn into a finished make, right? You need to really get out of your head when it comes to making. All of these elements become components of what it is that we want to create. This tag right here, great tag for a background, but it could easily become, if you had say a little number two tag, you know, little gift tags, or you wanna just actually turn that into a number two tag. 
we can take this and just create border cuts, punch a hole or die cut other elements. And now you have some pieces that can turn into something else. This would be great to go on a, a small card that maybe you put an ideology embellishment, you put a label sticker, there are things. And now you're going to get essentially two and a half. I would use this one to die cut out of a tag that you made. So when you're sometimes looking at stuff and you're like, oh, it's not balanced or it's to this, or it's to that. That is what's really important to remember about all of those things that you may have been playing around with throughout the season, throughout the year, you have those elements, okay? But if you work with cardstock and I'll just talk about cardstock, don't get too hung up on your cardstock. You need to use what you like, okay? Um, I love craft stock. Obviously, that's why I designed this for uh, Ideology. This used to be with a company called Coordinations back in the day, and they went out of business, and Ideology uh, took over the craft stock. And what it is, it is a craft-based paper that is printed in color. And I love this because if you do embossing folders or anything like that, you can sand this, sand off the printed color to reveal the craft core. If you tear it, you get the craft reveal. I just love the, the look and feel of craft. Now, this is how the regular craft stock used to come. I say used to come because all of this paper has been retired, right? This color, all the metallic. So once they're sold out, they're not coming back in the paper pads, right? They're just gone. It is what it is. But the original craft stock had this like linen texture. And I like that, but I'll admit as a stamper, uh, it was very inconvenient. We had this for years, but I was really using this mostly for backgrounds. But then I found, gosh, I really love the idea of stamping on a color and then maybe going in and inking an area or using oxide on this because oxide is so good on craft stock. So this year, at the beginning of the year, we revamped the regular craft stock pad. So we took these colors, we printed it, we went from an 80 pound cover to 100 pounds, so this is thicker. But then we went from a textured, a linen paper, to smooth. So this is the new craft stock. And th this craft stock, it comes in six by nine because it didn't matter that it was a, a piece of paper. I'm going to cut this up. And six by nine is much better for die cutting. You'll see exactly why uh, it's six by nine. Everything has a reason, but just kind of takes a while to get there. So the cool thing about this, you can hear it much thicker, hundred pound, but now you can see it is smooth, but it's got that cool kind of I don't know, very distressed printing already because it is an ink on craft. It is printed. So the, the great thing is instead of just seeing like this solid flood, you already get some depth of that. Because it is six by nine, let me move these out of the way. Yeah, I do love my metallics. They're pretty beautiful. I'll show you those in a second. Um, but the six by nine, we can take this little mini guy. And if I'm going to work in the sidekick, which I, I love to work in the sidekick, you're going to just basically use the, the size of your cutting pad as your guide. So I just lay this here and I know that my cutting pad for a sidekick is two and a half inches wide, okay? That's what's going to go through this machine. So when I do a lot of prep for my die cutting pieces for the season, I will cut this in two and a half inch strips. So you're just gonna go in, make that cut, go in, make that cut. And it's, again, this is something you can just do just watching television. Right, just sit there and be like, okay, I'm just gonna cut my strips. This is just a bonus that I'll use maybe for punching. Maybe I can stamp a sentiment, whatever. It's not a waste, just leave that. But now I've got three pieces for my sidekick. Now let's talk about length. I like to keep the cardstock this long, even though it's longer than the cutting pad, that's okay. It's still gonna go through the machine. So I chop this off because now I can cut from this end whatever little elements. And then when I've used all this part, well, now I've got really the rest of this cardstock. Maybe I chopped this off, whatever that is, but don't trim it to fit the full size. As long as it, it's not any wider, it'll go through your machine. It can always be longer, okay? So this will allow me just to take my pieces. That's what I love about this little guy. It's super, it's just, it's nice to have because again, you can just do all of those kind of quick, just quick things with it, to be honest. All right lock that in okay so I've got strips of paper you can repeat do that do that once it's done we're going to add adhesive to it now you can do whatever adhesive you want uh, Sizzix sells adhesive sheets I know a lot of other companies sell adhesive sheets I'm a huge fan of a Xyron uh, you can buy a Xyron uh, in regulation size you can also buy a mini I like that this one kind of folds up okay 
So it's just a cool one to have. So I'm just gonna open this up. This particular, this is the regular size iron, maybe for eight and a half by 11, is going to allow me to uh, pre-adhesive. You can buy different cartridges. If you're not familiar with a, a Zyron, you can do adhesive, permanent, repositionable, um, laminate. I like permanent adhesive because, well, it's just gonna stick. And you're going to put your paper in pretty side up. Now this is nice because it will allow you to fit three sheets as long as you stay within your, there's little stopper guides. I also like, it just depends. Some people really maximize uh, and put things super close. I like just to have a little bit of a, a gap. I might even have more of a gap just to make things easier. Okay, Oops, that one's, there we go. And you push it like where it kind of engages into the stuff, you'll feel it. Then I'm gonna take my handle. I'll kind of move this so you can see. There's my little handle. And I'll just start cranking this. And it's, what, we're, what we want it to do is we want it just to grab the, the elements here. So let me just take this, hold on a second. Is this even in Mario? Mario's like, I gotta, there we go. Yeah, it's not, it's not cranking through, dude. Hold on. Look at that, technical issues. I think the cartridge is under the blade. There we go. It's a brand new roll. I know, I said to, I said tomorrow, I'm like, make sure we have a brand new cartridge. So here's your cartridge. Here we go, we can talk about that. So that's what you get. You can find these at uh, craft stores. So you can often use a, a coupon on these or you can even get them. I think we even get ours on Amazon because our craft stores don't sell them anymore. But you're gonna take that, that starting piece. Oh my gosh. I have to do this without my iPhone. Feed this under the roller. There's two, can you guys see that? Two rubber rollers. This is hard to do with a, a camera. Oh my gosh, I feel like an idiot. There we go. Can you guys see that? That's all I'm doing. And then you just drop it in the cartridge. There we go, there's blades, click that closed. Okay, there we go. Let me just get this started. Perfect, trimmer, done. Okay, we didn't get it all prepped. That's good, then you guys really see it. Okay, let's start that again. Put your paper in so it touches the stuff. Then, I know someone said impromptu demo. You're right, for a Zyron. Then we're gonna just start. So you can see how it grabs your paper. That's all you wanna do. Then you're just going to watch the other side of it. Once your paper comes out, right? Can you guys see that, where it starts to come out? It comes with a cutting blade. So you want it just to go past that blade, you're gonna press this down, it's got a little slider, press it down, slide up, and off you go, right? But here's the big tip. If you've ever done adhesive, oh, it's a little crooked, that's all right. Welcome to my wonky world. If you've ever done adhesive, one thing to remember is that all of this stuff doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if it's crooked or straight, it just needs to be on the sheet. Take some type of scraper. It could be a card, a credit card, whatever that happens to be, and you just wanna burnish the adhesive on the paper itself. Now let me tell you this. Some people, why not the whole paper and cut? You can do that, Jackie, but you, you're going to risk getting the adhesive on your trimmer blade. That's what I don't like. So I prefer to cut and then do the adhesive. But that's just me, you do you. I just think that if you're doing that, um, you just get a lot of adhesive buildup on your trimmer that I have found. So here's a tip to avoid getting adhesive buildup on your scissors as well. Once this is run through, you're going to take some type of scissor. I'm gonna get a, I think I have just a big pair. Here's right here. Thank, they're right here. God, thanks. This'll work. I like to work with just a big scissor. You can use whatever. But normally you would burnish and you would peel this film off. And what that does is that's gonna pull off all of this extra adhesive. Again, I don't do it that way. Instead, I leave the film on and I just start trimming this up. If you take, I love these, uh, shears. So if you start a little cut right at the edge, then you can just push your scissor right off. Okay. So I'm, I mean, could you make the whole cut? Yes. But these scissors are sharp enough that you make the cut and you push through it. Once you do that, you don't get any adhesive on your scissor at all. Nothing. Okay. Then this piece literally slides off because often if you pull this off, you leave that little like webbing of adhesive around the edge. And then when you go to trim the paper, that's where the adhesive is transferred. So that's why I just prefer to do it this way. So I'll just sit there, slide this across the sheet. Now, if you have these big scissors, could you just make the cut? Yes, but 
you know, it's kind of like using one of those wrapping paper trimmers. It's super fun to push a blade through paper, isn't it? There you go, slide that off. So what I'm creating is just pre-adhesive paper. Yeah, and I just, I love having these giant shears for that because it does have a different uh, kind of blade in the back that allows for that really nice cut just to go through all of this stuff, done, slide this off, done. So that's what we have created uh, in, this, in this tin, a bunch of strips of pre-adhesive paper. Now everything that is die cut, you just stick it on. So that's how we do colorize. That's how everything is done. And look at these metallic colors. I love all these metallics because the metallics come in um, just a variety of different types. There's, there's a gold and silver pad. There's a copper and bronze pad. There's a champagne and onyx. There are confections, which are kind of pastel metallics and jewels, which are bright metallics. But these are all great because again, they're craft coated and this is inked, not foiled. So because it is inked and not foiled, you can sand it and still go in and do your inking without like pulling things off and, and ripping this around. That's what's really great. So when you see all of the, the packaging for Sizzix, all the dyes, the colorize, it is all done with this type of paper because everything you cut, you just peel and stick, peel and stick right? Whatever it is you're, you're going to cut. So let me take the other pieces. So I'll be honest as well. I was just demoing like that many pieces. If you know, you already have your card planned out and you're like, Hey, I'm going to use a lot of a green. Well, then you're going to do a bunch of colors, but usually in my tin, I just have one of each to start. And then the extra pieces, because we have all these strips, right? Because I mean, I was in like cut mode. You have bags of strips already because you're gonna get three out of a sheet. So sh 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 cut those and then you just throw those in a bag and then when you need them, Zyron, good, because maybe there's gonna be makes where you don't need it, Zyron, right? Maybe you want a piece of that color cardstock that you wanna stamp on and it's perfect for a card. I don't really use full on Zyron to stick something on a card. I'd rather use a tape runner or adhesive or something else that, that's a little different. I just think that's, that's really, really good. So that to me is, is a good tip for cardstock. Okay. So die cutting it. Well, let me just, let me grab a die cut. Another bin in my cart are die cut stamps and stencils. Okay. So another part of the creative process is going through and I have mine in a stamp binder normally, uh, but I just go in and I choose some stamps that I want. A lot of them are from this year, but there's some older ones, right? There's some, I'm gonna do that plaid technique that Stacy shared. This is one of my favorites. I love uh, those vintage classic sentiments. Uh, again, ideas. <clears throat> I may or may not use them, who knows, but I have them out. And if I have them out, I'm likely to say, oh yeah, I did wanna make a card because this was one of my favorites, Modern Christmas. It was so long ago, but how cool is that gonna be uh, just using some embossing glaze, right? doing this for little tags. So I just choose some sets. It doesn't mean you can't go and get other ones you didn't choose, but, and it doesn't mean that you can't change your mind, but this way you're not gonna waste an hour of your time each time you're gonna make going through your stuff. You have some pre-selected stuff. Same with some stencils. I just went through my ring and chose some holiday mini size and some big size. We'll get to those uh, in one of the demo weeks. And then same thing with dies. I have just a lot of die cuts that uh, I like to work with. Not every die is going to fit in your sidekick, right? Your bigger dies, you're gonna need your uh, Vagabond or whatever whatever machine you, you wanna work with. But Holiday Minis, that's definitely gonna fit in a sidekick. Uh, the greens, hey, oh my gosh, there's the village. Oh, see, I can't even decide what I wanna do on this one. Let's take, uh, I'll take this Holly one. That'll, that'll work right here, okay? I like that overlay. I'm gonna just stick this back in the cart. It is nice just to kind of have stuff out at the ready. That's all it is. We'll take this and we'll take out the dies. Now, when it comes to, I haven't put all my dies on magnets yet. That's gonna be a, a fun thing that, cause even Mari's like, are we gonna put these on magnets? I'm like, yeah, not right now. We'll probably get there. Here's the rule to follow. Your dies, as long as it fits on the cutting pad, you can use it with a sidekick. Now, if your die is super, super detailed, like something like this, give it a shot. It's either gonna work or it's not gonna work, right? Because technically, if a die is very detailed and you normally need to use a precision base plate, 
there's not a precision base plate for the sidekick. There won't be one. It's just the machine is not designed for that much pressure. It's just a portable machine, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try it first. That's what I always say. Try it. If it doesn't work, you can always line the die back up and then take it to your Vagabond or whatever other machine that you that you're going to want to work with. But let's just say we want to go in with with this Holly. I'm going to try both of them. Why not? Okay. So I'll take this. We'll just do a regular cardstock. I'm going to place this on the cutting pad. Make sure on your cutting pad you don't go right to the edge with your die because it's really going to be important that when you're doing this, you understand that there's a contour of that. That's what's going to grab on the machine. You're going to place this blade side down over the, the pretty part of your paper. Some people do blade side up. It's really you do you. I like to see where I'm cutting as long as it fits on the cutting pad. I'm going to put this one. Look how nice and clean this one is. Got myself a nice clean cutting pad. I don't like to go right to the edge because if I have the real estate, I would rather the machine grab the die first before it goes into cut, right? And then I'm just gonna place this down. Now, could you go in and use uh, tape and use adhesive? Yes, yeah, so let me give you the next tip. So let's say you're, you're doing a lot of cuts like this and this whole part is driving you crazy, okay? Let's just say the whole idea of laying your die down because let's face it, for the holiday season, we do a lot of repetition. This might be, oh, it's moving, it's moving, it's moving. Okay. Sticky grid, which I talk about quite a bit, is different than an adhesive sheet. It's called a sticky grid. And we have it in small for a sidekick, large for a regular machine. If you have this, can you cut these to fit? Absolutely. So if you have the bigger ones, you can cut them down. There is no difference. These are just already pre-sized for this cutting pad. But one good holiday tip is to take your sticky grid, and that's going to be going to have a grid so you'll know if you don't see a grid you're using the wrong product some people sometimes confuse adhesive sheets which Sizzix sells for sticky grid <laughs> they're not the same okay so what I would do is start with a clean cutting pad if you can because sticky grid lasts longer on a clean cutting pad and I'm going to peel off one side of the protective film I'll stick it on to the cutting pad and I've shown this for the village and we'll talk about that when we do the village uh, collection next Saturday. I'll peel this off. So one end that's got a printed end with the logo has no ad adhesive. So that's just going to allow you to peel that off and reveal that. And this stays sticky for a long, long time. This is good for those kind of makes. Again, if you're in front of the television, you want to just keep going and keep going. Instead of doing it the way I showed you before, where you would have to like lay this down, maybe it even put washi tape to make sure this doesn't move. We can still reverse the process, right? We can now just place our die down blade side up, right? So now we're kind of doing the reverse sandwich really. Now that's not moving. And now we can take our paper and you're gonna place that pretty side down. The paper can also tack to the sticky grid so it's not gonna move. So this is just going to allow you to do your, your cut, if you will. And I'll put it in my sidekick over here, just rolling it through, crankety crank, okay? There's our cut. You can see, right? As long as you see that blade cut. And then you're just going to go in, peel this off. Usually takes that right out. And there is your cut piece. Your die remains, right? So now if I'm just, again, doing repetition, I can figure out, okay, well, I'm gonna place this down. If you don't see your die through the window, you have a clean area. It's very, like, I don't need to go trim this off again. But if I did this, you see how my die is showing through? Uh-oh, that's not gonna be good unless you don't care that you're gonna get a little bit of a funky cut. So I'm just gonna move this down this way because I essentially think, well, that's gonna probably fill this space, so that's why I just flipped it. If you just wanna move up again, that's fine. You'll have a void and you can use the scraps for other things. But this is just, it's all about time-saving tips. It's about, you know, these little ideas where you think, gosh, I really don't have time to do this. Gosh, you just, you're sitting there, you've got all your green paper one night just done, and now you're going to sit there and say, okay, now I'm just going to go in and, and the fact that it's on your media mat, and if you don't want to have a big media mat, maybe you're doing this in front of the television, right? There's this guy, right? This is the travel media mat. Some people call it the lap media mat. Uh, it comes in this neoprene case, but this is the same idea, but much smaller. So your sidekick can go there, it can sit on your lap and you can, off you go. So whatever works for you. It's all about that, that whole convenience. So again, I'll just take this, peel this up, got my paper, right? And these, 
pieces are still good. You might need things for little colorizing, anything that you want to work with. All this stuff is still prime real estate paper just for smaller things. Maybe you have paper punches. Maybe you have other things. All right. But now I've got these holly leaves, these sticky ones. Okay. And the adhesive is still on the back. They, the release sheet. Okay. So let's move on to the next layer. Let's see how that next layer cuts. That's going to be our detailed piece. That's going to be the outline. The cool thing about uh, this, maybe you don't want to do the outline. Maybe you just like the solid. Fine. Totally fine. All right. Okay. Question. What is your rationale of using multiple die cutting machines? Why not just the vagabond? Well, convenience, portability. So this sidekick is just sitting there uh, on my table ready to go instead of having to do the, the vagabond. But if you only have the vagabond, then you can just use the vagabond. So my rationale for machines, it just depends on how you die cut as a maker. That's when I, when I say you do you, I mean that with all sincerity that you have to do what you feel is, is going to work the best. If you're sitting there and you have the space to have your vagabond out and you're like, I'm in die cut mode and I'm going to get all my stuff out. Well then yes, because it's a bigger surface. It's going to allow you to cut many things. This is about saying, okay, I'm going to have portability and convenience for the making season. I'm going to have a smaller trimmer so I can do my cuts when I'm, when it's just on the, the table, I'm going to have my sidekick just to do a lot of fast cuts when I'm working on other things. Because as a, as a maker myself, I don't, I don't have the, I don't know, the patience of sitting there and doing the same thing in repetition, especially around the holidays, I'll work on stuff and then I'll totally switch my mode. So this, I've got the outline die. I've got some metallic cardstock. So I love, this is a little bit of some green. I like having a little bit of lime and again, pretty side down and we're going to go in. So I think as with any tool as a maker, just to kind of touch base on that question, like I think tools for makers, it's really about creative convenience more than anything, right? All right. So on this pass, it appears that it has cut through. If you look and you think it didn't cut through, there's nothing wrong with just giving it a second pass, but I'm not going to give it a second pass until I know for a fact that it, it didn't cut through. Okay. But we'll see. We'll know in a minute. I would give it a second pass for one reason. I'll show you this. It, it did cut out, but you see how it didn't cut fully on the release paper. That's going to annoy me if I have to go in and, and like pull this off each time, but it did cut through uh, the die, but see the release paper, that wax paper. That's what's going to annoy me because I like to have just pieces. I'll just take this off. I like to have pieces that are all done. So I'll flip this over. I'll pop this out, pop this out. And I still have a piece, but I prefer to have all my release paper on my piece. Otherwise it, it just doesn't make for creative convenience for me. So I would give that a multi-pass, but the design it cut. So the benefit of this now is I've got a piece and I can just take all these little elements out, all these pieces. I'll take my die pick and just kind of move those out. I also like to use this nonstick mat just to stick the pieces. Like if you ever have sticky pieces and they're driving you crazy, just stick them here because it's way easy to, to clean up when you're, when you're weeding your die, so to speak, because this has some, some cut out negative pieces. Can you see that? All right. Then I'll just take off my release paper. Well, what's left of it I should say. Okay. So I've got this layer. Now, could you use a liquid adhesive? Absolutely. You could, could you, if you had a clean cut, place this and use all these negative pieces and place it on another make. Absolutely. There's a million ways that we can repurpose any of the scraps. If that's the type of maker that you want to be right. Cause some people like to use both the positive and negative. That's fine. But now that this has adhesive on it and you can see it, it's sticky, but it's not overly sticky where you, you can't maneuver it. I just can't get my fingers to work. Um, so what you can do is you can either place this directly on top, or you can offset it, whatever you want. I'm going to place this one directly on top. And I like the fact that when I'm using uh, the Xyron, I still have the flexibility to, to move it, to get it perfectly lined up the way I want it to be. And then I'll just go in, press that down. And now I've got this piece. So this is one of those things that I was saying that I would sit down. Maybe, maybe one night I'm just in Holly mode right? Where I'm cutting this, I'm cutting this, I'm layering these, and I put these in a bin or a bowl or a tin, and I have these pieces. The other thing to remember about your die cut shapes is just because it's designed like this doesn't mean you use it like this. You certainly can, 
But this is going to be, for me, I'm like, ooh, bonus. That's a three for one. Now I can go in and take this and trim this apart. You cut that element, put that back on. Trim this one here, make that little cut in here. And now I've got three holly leaves that I can use whatever. So maybe even if, even if one is, cause I would, for me, I think one is too, too little. I would still put a whole bunch of holly leaves now in the tin. And now when I go and make a card, I'll just take two random ones, peel and stick. And so if I'm going to do a card front, again, this isn't about like making the finished card, but you'll get the idea. You're going to want to peel off the back. Now you could go in with your die pick and you can try to remove the back, but let me just talk about picks. Not all picks are created equal. And this is not a, an infomercial for bye, bye, bye. This is just letting you know if you ever get frustrated and you think, gosh, why isn't this working? Well, is it working for what it's intended? Yes. Is it working for what you want it to do? Possibly not, but you can't hold the, the tool of fault for that, right? So here's a die pick. A die pick is made out of tempered steel, right? And the fact that it's tempered steel, it's designed to poke in and use in a prying motion. So that's what's going to either pierce through the holes in the back of a die, maybe to release it, right? Those are all your poke holes. Or maybe you have a Biggs die where you need to actually pry something out of a steel rule die. That's what this is designed for, okay? It has a cap that goes on. A craft pick, like the craft pick from Tonic or any other craft pick, um, this is a different type of metal. It is not a tempered steel, okay? It's st still made out of steel, but it's not tempered, which means it's not as as durable. It's not meant to be used in a prying motion. And if you use a craft pick to dig things out, you often bend the tip or dull the tip of a craft pick. Well, it's not that this craft pick is made cheap. It's the fact that you're using it for something it's not designed for. It's designed, well, a lot of people call it a pokey tool. It's designed to pierce holes into things and to pick. The cool thing about this one, you can see that uh, it has a little, little push spring action. And each time you extend it, it locks in but also the longer it gets, the larger the diameter it pierces through. So if you're only poking a small hole, maybe you only want that, like maybe for a brad, right? But if you're gonna stitch through a card and you need the eye of a needle to go, go through it, well then you may wanna go all the way up because if you pierce all the way to the back, you're gonna get a larger diameter hole than you would in the front, okay? But the cool thing about a pick is because it has that little sharp edge, it's just going to allow you to go right to the back of this stuff and peel off, of course, my eyes are garbage. Right, Mario? Normally I sit there, if, if it's like most of you guys as makers, you sit there, you look up, you have your tongue sticking out. Let me just bring this closer to my face because you have to see it. That's what I do. I have my tongue sticking out as a maker. I'm like, ooh, I've Wait, got this. You think that's helping you? Yeah. <laughs> I, it gives me balance. I think it gives most makers balance. So you just pierce, you lift that off, right? And another cool thing about this, especially if you are like a shaky, shaky maker, right? Like shaky, maybe, shaky maker. well, because maybe you had a little too much coffee or you try to, to set this down and you just, I don't know, sometimes I, I shake when I'm placing things down. When I peel off the adhesive sheet, I actually press this onto the pick. You saw with my finger, I press this on. And now I can just turn this position exactly where I want to put this because sometimes I'll use tweezers, right? If I have them, but the fact that I just peeled this off makes it pretty easy. I can position where I want this to go, then press my finger for the dismount, remove that, you're good to go, okay? A couple of things to know if you're ever using any type, any type of adhesive, maybe it's going to be uh, this type of adhesive or maybe it's something use double stick tape. If you are an inker and you have inked, this one's big enough that I can just grab my pork chop fingers, but if you are, if you are an inker and you have inked a background, of your card first with Distress Ink or Oxide and you are trying to stick something to it with any type of adhesive, you want to go in and heat set your inked background before you stick anything on, even if that's another card layer. Because Distress Ink and Distress Oxide contains resin and although it would be dry to the touch, that resin usually takes at least 48 hours to cure air dry or just a few seconds with heat. So if you were going to build your cards and you had done your inking, it's just a good idea when you're done inking just to heat set your background and then your stuff will stick to it. Otherwise, if I had inked this first and then tried to stick these down, it wouldn't stick. The same thing with rub-ons. A lot of times people try to use the ideology rub-ons over an inked card or an inked journal page and you didn't heat set your ink and you're like, but Tim, they're dry. I know they're not wet, they're dry. But the resin is still wet and sometimes resin doesn't even dry in some products. 
So if ever you're going to put adhesive or rub-ons over an inked surface, just take a heat tool, heat it up. That's going to actually cure those inks and everything is going to stick to your inked backgrounds way better. Okay. Some people can't be bothered with adhesive sheets. Some people are just gluers. That's okay. No judgment, right? This is just about ideas. It's not about saying this is how you have to do it. And you know, how do you do it? It's just for ideas. That's all this is. So that is the creative convenience. I think of having pre-adhesive paper. I always like to use a die pick just to take this off of that sticky grid because if you try to use your fingernails, you'll do it one time where you get a die shoved up under your nail and then you'll realize not to do it again. It might take you more than once, let's be honest. It takes me a few times, all right? So just a, a quick way, what do I do with this? Well, there's a couple of things you can do. You can either save this sheet and cover it back up, right? Put it back to bed. Because if you're not gonna use it for a while, any dust or anything is going to uh, stick on top of it. So that's an easy way to do it. Or you can just, put the two plates together and that will essentially cover it up. But if you do leave the sticky grid, oops, there's a die, exposed, then it will be, you know, dust, hair, whatever it is, okay? And that's really what this first part is about. I'm just sharing tips and tricks that you may know, you may be like, thank you, Captain Obvious, I got it. But it may just be that little reminder that you need to be like, okay. So that was the paper adhesive Xyron demo. I'm gonna save that, yeah get rid of the scraps. I'll save those. Okay. And all that stuff really goes in the tin. Uh, if you were really an organized person and when I get into making mode, cause I'll just talk about like when I do my, my packaging, I do have two separate bins, one for like clean sheets of paper and one for scraps, because then I know if I need a, a full sheet, I have it in this tin and my scraps go in another tin, but you know, I'm not here just to sell you hundred tins, although I'll be honest, I probably have about 20 tins in my studio because I like, well, you'll see in this video, I like to put stuff in tins. Okay. Organization is key. Organization is key. Okay. We've got that. We've got that. We've got that so far. So good, right? Okay. Another thing that we can put into bins are different products. So we've already talked about dyes. Here's another bin that I have. Now this one is just of mini inks and mediums. So because these are in tins, it was convenient for me to, to be able to have a full palette. I like to work with the regulation size distress inks usually uh, in my studio, but for a holiday make, I didn't want to have 60 plus large ink pads everywhere. And I, instead of limiting myself to color, I chose that this would be my watercolor medium. Maybe you're going to have a, a tin of markers or maybe you have something else, but these mini tins don't take up any, any space for me. And it is nice that I can have all of my uh, distress inks here. So I put those in there. This tin, I just have my set of blending brushes. So if I want to go in and just do blending through stencils, I have my blending tools that sit on a spinner. So that doesn't take any space. And then I have mini archivals. Maybe you don't want to stamp in all your colors of archival. So don't put it in. This isn't about like, you know, you're not moving in and you're not going on a, you know, a road trip where you need to put everything. It's just about the things you think you're going to use for mediums. I chose stuff that I would want to do like, for texture. So texture paste is going to give me a great snowy effect. So I have matte and crackle. Grit paste is a dream, especially at Christmas time because translucent is going to give you a cool icy effect. The opaque is going to give you more of a snowy effect because this is white gesso based. This is clear gesso based. Okay. So I have both of those. I love a good tub of collage medium. So that's the only one I have out. I don't have a crazing and vintage cause that's, this is my go-to. I have some frosted crystal. This is pretty much my embossing, not just to create a matte effect, but if you saw a technique that Stacy did on her blog, we can also use frosted crystal as a sticky powder. So to me, it's like a two for one. So I put that in there. And then of course, I just have a bag of my seasonal mediums. Gotta love that clear crackle paste, icicle, and then the grit paste snowfall. That's what I put in there. Again, you have to put in what's gonna work, but having this, this drawer where it's like, okay, those are the mediums I've got, cool. These are the mini inks I have that's going to work perfect. Okay. As far as all the tools, I know you saw that, that bin at the top. I'm going to try to take this in here. I'm not going to get too much into ideology. Uh, but this thing, this is something I picked up whoop, at Hobby Lobby. You can pick up whatever you want, whatever works. So here's what I've, here's what I have in mind. I like that it is, I call it stadium seating, right? It's a little cascading uh, metal thing, but you can find a lot of different organization bins. I have full sheets of cardstock in the back. I have pre-cut pieces in the front. So that's my four and a quarter, five and a half. 
these are my smaller ones. So I, I love a good stash of tags, huge fan of tags. These are distress tags, right? So they're already the mixed media heavy stock. So I have those in there. These guys, I like these because not every card front is a huge background. So sometimes I just wanna make mini backgrounds of things that I'm going to die cut. So my other stack is where I just go in, I'll go into this little guy again, and I take that same quarter cut piece of cardstock, right? Four and a quarter, five and a half. But now I'm just gonna turn it this way and cut it at two and three quarters, All right? So that's gonna be your, your half cut of five and a half. And then I have this size. So that's what these guys are. So not only do I cut these kind of pieces that I know I'm gonna want big backgrounds, but sometimes I quarter cut those because it allows me to just do smaller, quicker, different backgrounds. And I have them in all different mediums because maybe I wanna use uh, mixed media heavy stock or maybe I wanna use white or craft. And just having it at the ready, gosh, it's creative convenience, that's all it is. But in the front of here, I have an adhesive that I'll use, which is normally collage medium, but maybe yours is glossy accents, whatever. Just some little, tools that I'm gonna work with most of the time, which of course was, that's where I found my, my craft pick, a couple palette knives, a water brush, maybe a remnant rub tool, a paint brush, some collage brushes. I don't have every size. I don't have uh, every tonic tool. I don't have every, every brush. It's just the stuff that I know I'm gonna to go to uh, a lot. I love a splatter brush during the holiday season for snow and metallic, okay? Then uh, because this is on a cart, you can go to Ikea, Home Depot, any kind of hardware store and find uh, S-hooks. You can find them really anywhere. An S-hook is great for makers because it'll hook on anything. It'll hook on the side of a cart. I don't put them on the baskets because then the baskets won't pull out. Um, so I just have these hang off the side and that's where I have my brayers, right? Because a brayer to me is a big clunky thing. Maybe you wanna hang your scissors off of there too. But that S-hook just allows you to hook that little tool these hang off the side, and this actually hangs over the side of the cart, right? So S-hooks are really a, a great way that if you have something that you can hang off of, you can hang those different tools off of the S-hook. There we go, get our camera reset again. It's like, what happened? Okay, so that's what I kind of have uh, sitting on the top from a, a tool perspective that I dig in. I can throw all of those things in. So that's where my tools are. All right, another drawer, we've already talked about, um, there we go. We've already talked about dies and stamps. Let me pull out this drawer. So I'm gonna show you the drawers first and then we'll get into some inky fun because I think that's really important. This is my ideology basket, my basket of love right here, okay? Uh, this is this year's release. It has a few stuff from previous years, but I love the idea of having some ribbons and I haven't taken these out of the package, but by the time I do, I'll probably put it into a tin because I told you tins are life. If you have them, it's a great way to be organized and you can see what you have but I've got like backdrops and wallpaper and rubs. I do keep stuff in packaging a lot. I find it very easy to work out of the ideology packaging, right? Because it's got this adhesive at the bottom where you can just peel this open, dump out the bag and look for it. A lot of people organize their stuff, right? So maybe you wanna put your layers and ephemera in a tin. You do what is gonna work for you. That is ultimately what's important. But I took out some stencil cards that I wanna use. I've got the files, I've got paper dolls. I've got some tins in the back. I've got some collage paper, um, some ephemera. I do love uh, other things. I love washi tape, but I hate that washi tape is just everywhere in a pile. I love using the storage tin for washi tape because it just fits rolls of washi tape. One, I can see what's in there. So this isn't all the washi tape I have. Let's be real here. But they are like the festive ones that I like. And because I don't want my tapes rolling around everywhere, although it could, I chose some other things that I may or may not use, right? Like I love this one. It's got the, the pointy finger, right? That's a fun one that I could use. There's ledgers, there's cigar boxes, but just having one tin of tape, that's going to allow me to just, if I want to put a little strip of tape, there it is, it's right there. These are just things that, that allow you to see what you have, access it easily, and then just put it back in, right? Pocket cards, we talked about this if you do December daily. Also a great way you can store your pocket cards in a tin like this if you don't wanna put them back in the package. Just remember, you need to kind of set up a space that you know is going to be usable and workable for you throughout the season. That's essentially what you're gonna do. So commit yourself like six hours or one day or one night or just two hours, whatever time you have and set yourself up to space. That means whatever was in this, take it out for the season. 
right? If you had, you know, your favorite paper pads in there, take them out for the season and use that basket for stuff you're going to use specifically to make, all right? So for tapes, right? I just like to, to be able to look at them. I think it's one of those things that I'm, I'm not much of a super organizer because I think if I just get too caught up in organizing, I'm just gonna wanna look at it and not use it because I wouldn't wanna mess it up. So, but again, you do you. So let me take this off because I'm gonna need to get this off of my mat to show you the, the bottom drawer of this particular cart. The bottom, of, bottom drawer of this cart happens to be, let me just wipe this, wipe that water off. Uh, it happens to be a much bigger drawer, okay? So let me take this, that's gonna be a two hand job. All right, Ugh. so this is where, for me, ah, this is my drawer of happy, right? So this bottom one is one big basket that has all of my tins. So do I have all the colors of everything? Of course I do, but these are colors that I'm going to use for the season. So I went through all of my mediums and decided, okay, what am I gonna use? What do I wanna take? How am I gonna work with it? And that's what I decided to put here. So let me clear off some space here. And just so it'll, there we go. Perfect. Thanks, Mario. Just so I'm gonna get this basket off camera and then I'll just pull stuff in. It'd just be easier this way, guys. All right, so I have a lot of stuff stacked. You can see that like the distress tins I have stacked, the spray tins, I have one of each. Here I've got an alcohol tin and some sparkle, and then there's three storage tins that stack. Again, you have to do what's gonna fit in, in your cart, but if you're, if you're looking at carts, I mean, little drawers are great, but if you don't leave yourself one big kind of dump drawer, that's important because sometimes we want it for, I don't know, for whatever it is we're gonna, we're gonna create with, okay? So here I've got my oxides. Oxides don't come in mini size, so they're regulation, so this is just the Distress Ink uh, tin. So I went in, chose some colors of oxide that I want to use. Uh, I haven't labeled mine, but of course, some people, uh, if you have them labeled, you can see them that way. But I just know that I've got it set up in, in rainbow order. So I've got my reds here. And then I just jump right to, uh, to a yellow. I didn't have, you know, a lot of different, I didn't go full rainbow. I just chose things that I think I would want to use, different shades of green that I like in this medium. That's the other thing to remember as a maker. Choose different mediums that you want. Right, so I don't necessarily, especially when you see the sprays, I don't have the same color stain as I do in oxide because some colors for the season, like these are great, bundled sage is amazing green uh, in oxide for Christmas because it has that nice, rich, deep color. I will say I have ice spruce in a lot of things. Uh, evergreen bough, so I kind of went into that. I do have, of course, villainous because that's gonna be a beautiful wintry sky. And then for these, I love frayed burlap and hickory smoke. Frayed burlap because it's a brown that thinks it's a green in an oxide, and I love hickory smoke. So I just chose colors. Now, just because you set this up doesn't mean that throughout the season, you're not using a color or a color doesn't work for you. Switch it out, right? You're, you're the maker, but this just really limits the choices of like, ooh, let me go through all 60 plus colors and see what I want. That's what I've got in one of the tins, okay? I mentioned sprays. So I have a tin of each spray because I think that when you're working with sprays, uh, having both oxide and spray stain, uh, really important, right? I love that, of course, the dividers are in there. So if I'm working with stuff, I don't have to worry about the bottles falling over because it's got that, that little catch at the bottom. But there you go. Peeled paint. Colors I'm going to use maybe for woodland trees, right? West, rustic wilderness, peeled paint. Uh, I love aged mahogany in a spray stain. Oh, such a great dark color. Uh, talk about ice spruce. You can see I don't have much left, but I've already got a backup. Speckled egg I like. Uh, salvage patina. This one's salvage patina. Uh, hickory smoke. And then, of course, over in the oxides, just some different colors. So maybe this one I want a little tattered rose. And you think, why would you want pink? Well, if I want to go in and make a red a little bit more dreamy, not necessarily pinky, tattered rose is really good because it's a vintage pink versus kitsch flamingo, right? But again, you need to do what you like. There's bundled sage in an oxide spray great on trees, um, evergreen bough. So some of the times these colors are like from my oxide pads, there's another ice spruce. I have that in both, as I mentioned, cause I love that color for Christmas. Forest moss is a great color in oxide because remember oxide is a fusion of dye and pigment. So you see how dark green that forest moss is, really a cool mix and you can use both, right? You can take both of those uh, elements when you're working with it. Then of course we have these guys, metallics, right? I love the metallic stains 
These are sprayable metallic stains. So these are opaque. These are not, these are not a mica, right? This is actually almost like a metallic spray paint, if you will, but it's water-based. But I have just a couple of metallics in there. So yeah, you just kind of do, do the stuff that you want to do. Get the colors that you want to work with here. So instead of saying what you need to have or what you don't have or what you should have, use what you what actually exists. I think that's that's really important because you can make some colors. If you don't have the full palette, you can still make some of the colors that you that you like. Okay. If you plan on using alcohol inks, get some alcohol inks. If you don't plan on using alcohol inks, don't use alcohol inks, right? That's totally fine. Yeah, I agree. I saw someone, uh, Karen said Victorian velvet. That is a beautiful color. And I love that color for Christmas because it's kind of purpley pink. Um, alcohol inks, same thing. I've got just some colors. I've got some alloys. I've got a few, few colors of pearls. Again, just stuff of like blues, greens, purples, reds, just things if I'm gonna do traditional or if I'm gonna go for a kind of wintry sky. Of course, I've got uh, slate and mushroom because those are things that I use to antique stuff. Again, do I have all the colors? No, I just have that, just so I have a tin of it. Just makes it, makes it so much easier. You kind of see the tins. Glitters and micas. Uh, if you've seen any of the videos and demos, you know that I color these things in, well, all colors, right? I love the fact that I can customize Distress Glitter and Distress Mica Flakes into any rainbow of colors but I doubt I'm gonna be using uh, much orange or much yellow throughout the season. Doesn't mean I'm not going to, right? It's still in my studio, I'm not moving out, but I don't necessarily need it on my cart because I'm not gonna use it most often. So I just chose the colors that I'll probably use, some pinks and reds, different shades of green. I like different tones of, of sprinkles. Um, there's the rock candy. These are all tinted with alcohol inks. Again, there's demos on the blog. And then of course the new seasonal glitters right? The garland and tinsel because I love uh, those colors. So I put those in the tin because this tin is designed uh, to fit 12 of these storage jars. So Ranger sells these storage jars empty. You can put a lot of different jars, different embossing powder jars and all that. But I love having the uh, aluminum tops just because it kind of goes with the tin and the fact that it's clear. And you can store them any which way. You can also store them upright if you want to label the top, right? But why label the top when I can see the inside? Okay, so there you go. Again, same tin, crayon storage tin, distress storage tin. It's been relabeled a couple of times, see? Because originally it was just for crayons, right? When we sized it. And then I'm like, hold on, I put everything in here. I put crayons, I put jars, I put ephemera. I, I put so many things. So just distress storage tin, same tin, okay? Speaking of crayons, I love my crayons. So I do have two tins of these. Now, again, if you aren't gonna be using, uh, do much coloring, maybe you only need one tin of your favorite colors, but here I've just broken mine up between two tins uh, as a rainbow. I love to dig through my crayons, right? Just like as a kid, I didn't keep them in that stadium seating box that many people did. I was the kid that had that giant box and just dumped them out because I love to dig through colors. So that's just how I have mine. So I kind of have it, uh, again, Roy G. Biv, so I know that this is gonna be red through green and this is gonna be blue through uh, black, brown, and metallic, okay? Because I, I think that you have to just take out the mediums you want to work with. And this, next to ink pads, my favorite distress medium on the planet. It is so versatile on so many things. And you're gonna see throughout this series, right? Let me take this little latch, it wasn't latched up. Um, how you can use these, because we're, we're gonna have a day devoted to ideology, a lot of cool stuff, all right? So embossing glaze. Now, even though this can fit 12 jars of embossing powder, I know that I probably am not gonna be using 12 jars of embossing powder. That's just me, I don't do a ton of embossing. Now, metallic embossing is completely different. Uh, you can have a tin devoted to that. But because I'm gonna do some embossing, I just put the stuff that I'm gonna emboss with instead of six more colors. But if you wanted to have 12 colors, you could put this somewhere else. But it just shows you how you need to set up your storage of what you're going to do as a maker. So now I've got my embossing dabber. So that's gonna be for backgrounds, chipboard, edges of maybe a deckled edge where I can just do a little embossing dabber, sprinkle some powder. You can put a couple metallics. These are just some of the distress embossing glazes that I'll wanna glaze uh, some of my die cuts with. And I'll probably switch this out, I'm not gonna lie. I'll probably put a couple metallics eventually because I'll find that, oh, I really need gold and maybe I'm not gonna use a lot of walnut stain. Okay, I'll switch it out because an embossing powder is going to fit in there as well. Okay, that's, that's what it's all about. 
But I'll tell you my biggest struggle as I was setting up. My biggest struggle is what am I gonna do with all of that seasonal stuff, right? The mica stains, the crayons, what am I gonna do? Because a tin does not exist for those uh, yet. So Ranger is working on a storage tin, okay? They've been working on it uh, due to obviously what's been going on uh, in the world. It's been delayed, it's delayed. There is a tin coming out next year that will fit the Distress reinkers, right, with the rubber dabber, because the oxide reinkers work in the alcohol tin. Uh, it also fits the paints, both dabber and flip top, and it'll fit this small spray. So whether you have mica stains or dilutions, so that one tin has these like different adaptable inserts, so it will fit all of those different things, okay? But that's not until next year, and I cannot wait for next year. So here's what I did last night. I took this tin. This is the Distress Ink Pad tin. It is this tin, okay? So I took this tin. I took out the insert. So in the tin, it has this insert, right? This is what's in all the tins. And don't judge that it's thin plastic. It does its job. It needs to be lightweight and it's actually very durable. But sometimes people take it out and they're like, ooh, this is cheap. I'm like, it wasn't cheap when you're using it. Just don't worry about it. It needed to be lightweight, but this is super durable. So I go in and I grab it. I kind of squeeze it because you need to get it out from under the lip. And I pull this out, okay? Because maybe I'll, when the tin comes out, I'll take this out again and I'll put stuff back. But here's what I did. I was able to get all of my mica stains, all 12 colors, and my mica crayons in this tin because these to me are specialized products. This is what's gonna be the sparkly bling of it all. And it's very, very simple to configure. So one of the things that I love is the fact that my mica stains uh, lay down. So who knows, even when the other one comes out, I might end up keeping it like this because as I mentioned, anytime you have pearl, right? That's gonna be the mica that's here. If you have it on the side of the bottle, it's way easier to mix up, right? You can hear that ball dislodge right away because you're just mixing it from the side versus having it all at the bottom. And sometimes that mixing ball gets stuck in the sludge, okay? So that's what's really nice. So I have those laying down. It fits, it fits both like that. And then you've got one on the side, but that's, that's all you need to fit the 12. You only need what you need. You don't need to say all the things that you should have it should do but then i wanted a divider because i'm not going to every time i take this out have these roll down and i push them back so i made one and of course i wanted mine to make to look like tin okay so my crayons they fit in there now do they fit as great as the crayon tin not really it's not meant for that though so there's a little lip so you take it out again you can't use something for what it's not intended for and then judge what it's should or shouldn't do but they they work you just have to get it out from under that little lip a little bit Okay, so there is my divided metallic tin. Now I'm not a tinsmith. I can't go in and do some metal, <laughs> right? I, that's just not what I am. So, but I'm, I'm a maker, you're a maker. So make, all right? So I took a piece of chipboard, right? Anything that's gonna be durable enough that you can cut. It could be a cardboard box. It could be whatever it is that you wanna do. And I cut this five and a quarter by one and three quarters. Then I went in and I cut those little edges because in the bottom of this tin, because it's stackable, it's got a, like a rolled edge to it. So you can see in there, see that little angle? I just notch it out. I didn't do a template. No one's gonna see that. I just chopped that out. And once I did, I wanted it to match. Now you could use metallic paint, you could use aluminum foil, you, you, you use whatever you want. But what I had were foil tape sheets, right? For the alcohol ink line, this adhesive back aluminum. Hey, this looks like aluminum, pretty good match. And so I just took one of these sheets, I peeled off half of it, right? I stuck it down, I took the other half, I folded it over so the top edge was nice and finished, right? So instead of doing front and back, you're able to, if you peel off the back, you start on the cut edge, right? Then you continue to peel the release paper, fold it over, smooth it out with your brayer or whatever it is you wanna do, trim off the excess with your scissor because you will need to do that, and then you have the piece. And now that piece, you put it in at an angle, slide it to where it fits. See, look at that, because remember we have the lip of that tin. I wanted to use the lip of that tin to my advantage. So you can't just drop it in because it's not gonna fit. So angle, slide it in. But then I wanted to secure it. Packaging tape, it's there, you can see it. Now you can see the mechanics, a little piece of clear packaging tape for the win. And all I had to do was on this side. I didn't need to do the whole T thing. 
if you need to, that's fine. But if you ever try to put tape in multiple directions, it's a bit tedious, but you do whatever, reinforce it however you want, put that in, folded it, put that in, folded it, and that's it. How did I know where to put this? Well, because I put these in first, right? I put one layer in and I'm like, okay, I wanted to have a little wiggle room. So you can see that they wiggle just a little bit. You create as much wiggle room as you want, but I didn't want it super tight because I didn't want too much pressure on this. And that's what I did. So I had these in there, pushed this against and then moved a little bit, tape, tape, and there you go. And now I have a tin for my seasonal stuff. Maybe this idea is not for you. Maybe you're like, yeah, Tim, and I have this nice plastic shoe box that I'm using and that works great. And you know what? That's great too. You, you have to do whatever works. But I knew that all my stuff was gonna be in a tin and I love just having a nice tin for these. Is it ideal? No, but it's better than not having one uh, for, for the making season, to me, to me. And then it allows things to be stackable. So I'm gonna keep this out because we're gonna, we're gonna use this. Uh, Mel said, yeah, you understand wiggle room. It is important. Sometimes you just measure so specific and then you have no wiggle room, all right? You did good, MacGyver. I thought it was fun. It was really good. really good. I thought it was really good, good fun. All right, so one other thing that I have just off to the side, we'll get more into this for ideology, but if you ever have something that you know you're gonna do a lot of, usually around this time of year, it's glittering or mica for me. I don't use this medium much throughout the year, but a lot of times I like to use glitter and mica on things. So make yourself some sort of glitter caddy or sparkle caddy, if that's what you like to do. What this allows me to do is it has the mediums that I'm gonna use mostly for glitter. I use glossy accents a lot because it dries shiny, which makes the glitter more sparkly. But sometimes I'll use collage medium. I've used collage medium a lot for mica flakes and so whatever liquid adhesives you wanna use. I also love resist spray. Resist spray is great for this time of year because it, it's kind of like a liquid glue and it allows me to, to dust things with glitter. I do have a glitter duster, speaking of dusting. So this is kind of my sparkle station. I have jars of just my mica flakes and glitter because I'll use, I'll use this more in volume, right? If I'm doing trees where I'll pour it on, I'll put it back in the jar. So that's why I have this. Maybe you're gonna have stuff in here that you wanna glitter. Maybe it happens to be trees or it's a chipboard alphabet or whatever. But I like the fact that if I'm in a glitter, cause I've said it before and I'll say it again. In this house, glitter is an outdoor activity. So when I'm going to glitter, I go outside. What's that? Here. Except when Monica's here. When Monica's here, glitter is the house. Um, uh, that's a whole nother story. But yes, yeah, so I, that's why I like the whole caddy idea. Because if I'm going to go glitter, I just take this and I'll take it outside. Right? It's so much easier, honestly, guys, whether it's cold or not. Put on a jacket, right? But it's so nice to be able to do this because it's not everywhere in the house. But maybe that's what you like. Or you're going to go in the garage or whatever. But I like having all my stuff there where I'm like, oh, I'm going to go sparkle some stuff. I'll throw in, might be cardstock in this side. It's usually not filled with a lot of trees, but I want to, I like to do trees in advance as well. So I've got stuff there. Um, and then I have a little sparkle station. So again, that's another idea. The whole purpose of this first part of the series is to get you ready for the making season. Get you ready. There, you have to prep, like with anything else. It, it's like, you know, if you're cooking food or anything, you need to prep things. You need to get prepared for the making season. And then that season is just so much easier, right? It's just better to go in and, and create that way. All right. So let's go in and just do a little demoing, shall we? I think that will be fun. We'll do a couple of backgrounds that I can add to my tins. And I think that'll be... That'll be a lot of fun. All right, I'm just gonna cut a few more things just because this paper is here and I want it, I want it cut. So I'm just gonna chop these at two and three quarter. It's a cute little trimmer. Yeah, if you do a lot of, um, cause like even watercolor cardstock that, that's really thick I and mean, that's what I love about a guillotine trimmer because you can go in and literally just cut like the smallest amounts of things off. That's my decal sheet, but yeah. Nice. Okay, done. And you'll get used to this. Some people like when they do it, um, like I've even known people to go in and actually snip this off because it drives them crazy. Cause I will tell you that like, if you're used to like doing a full on chop, right? Like push down. When you go to do your cut, your blade is gonna wanna go into that locking mechanism. Then you try to rip it back up. It, it's not that secure. It's just it's just more for like a safety latch. But if that drives you crazy, really, there's nothing wrong with taking it off. I wouldn't. 
because it's just going to remind you of like, you only need to push until it stops, right? And then you just latch it when you're done. But just keep that in mind when you go to use it. Nice background paper. Nice, nice. Okay. So when it comes to doing some making, I'm going to have a few things. I'll have, I've got over here my tin open of my, my mica stuff because I do like to work from my tins. If you have tins and the tins are keeping you organized, well, it does help if you kind of work from it. I also have my sprayer, got a heat tool, stuff that you want to work with. Here's another exciting thing. Look at, look at what, look at this gifted myself, a new splat box for the season, it's like right? Christmas. It's pretty nice. I can't wait to ink this thing up. It's going to be good, good. Um, so yeah, I have, I have a new splat box for the season just because really mine was pretty, mine was pretty bad. I've got it. I'm keeping it. I'm going to auction it off. I have to say that that splat like, box, wasn't, wasn't that splat box like two years Easy, or two more? Years. Probably at least three years, yeah. probably even more. So the splat box lasts a, a long time. All right. I'm going to go on my card. I'm just going to take out a couple other mediums because, well, I want to. So I'm going to take out some stains, right? Because if I'm going to do some spray backgrounds, I'll do that. Um, and then I think I'll even take out some, I could use some oxide spray, but I think for this one, I'm just going to use oxide pads. Sometimes like if you don't have sprays and you have ink pads, you can use both. You, you need to use what you have. That's really, really the most, I'm going to move some of this. It's getting a weird shadow. It's annoying me. There we go. Okay. So I've got stuff at the ready. I am surrounded. So when we go into making mode, everything that I've shared so far is about getting ready for the makes and every single thing about that is in fact, getting ready for the make. It's about creating a space that you have. That's going to have your, your papers that are already cut, your tags that you want to use, um, whatever it is that you want, you're going to have your products chosen. And this way, when you're ready to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to just do some backgrounds, just go into background mode, right? It might be watercolor cardstock. It might be craft. It might be wood grain. It might be cracked leather. It might be a lot of different things that you want. That's a little cracked leather that you want to work on. But this way you can just sit and play and don't, don't think about it, right? Don't think about anything being finished or being uh, too matchy matchy. I love working on the media mat because, well, that is my space and because I work on the regular media mat, as I mentioned, normally I'll have my sidekick. And now the fact that when I'm working, that mini trimmer is just off to the side. And it's funny because we, we've sent this to, um, to a few makers. We, we, had some, we had some extras to, to send out. And the cool thing about this is that for, for working with the trimmer, you don't really think about how much space a paper trimmer takes until you're always moving it around. So it is nice just to be able to throw that right off to the side. But now I can create some some backgrounds. So let's, let's start. Okay. I'm just going to take some mica stain, get those pre-mixed a little bit just to kind of get things flowing. There we go. All right. Good, good, good. Got a little, little holly branch, a little tree lot. This is another good one. A little frosted juniper. I want to make sure, do I have it here? Gosh, I hope I took it out. Ha 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 little villainous. Yes. I want it. Hey, focus camera. There we go. A little villainous potion on there. And let's see, I want another color. I don't want that color. Let's see. Do I have, yeah, I got some hickory smoke. Um, whenever I'm using like wintry stuff and this is just me, I'm not much of a, a vibrant bold guy. Uh, so a lot of times if I'm going to do stuff that, that is a bit more of the, the wintry sky, I like to muddy it. That's just me. And so usually I'll use a gray to, to muddy that. So I'll keep my greens over here for now. So I've got some frosted juniper, a little villainous potion. Now if hickory smoke is too muddy for you, another good muddy color is ice spruce, right? Come on. I don't know why this camera is so delayed in focusing. There we go. It's like sleepy eyes. Um, but ice spruce is really good because that will also kind of muddy or diffuse your colors. You, you do what's going to work for you. Ooh, let's take a little bit of salvage patina. Okay. So I've got a mica stain there, two colors of that, some spray stain in a color, and we'll start there before we introduce some oxide. Okay. So these are the only guys that you really need to mix up the mica stains in this assortment. If you have the oxide spray, you'll need to mix those as well. You want to kind of shake them back and forth, 
just to get stuff mixed up. Make sure you hear that mixing ball rattle, okay? Try to kind of shake it more like, like you're ringing a bell like this. If you shake it upside down, you could risk the stuff just spewing out of the sprayer. If that happens to you, just remove the clear cap, cover it with a paper towel, and then just shake the snot out of it. You know, go ahead and, and do that that way. Ooh, Sharon said it's snowing there. How nice, huh? That's beautiful. I have some favorites, I do. And that was the, that was also the fun part last night of, of setting up my makerspace for the season. It was very cool because like you kind of get to see all your stuff again and you're like, oh, I haven't used that color in a long time. Oh, I need to get those out. It was quite exciting. So just the setup part was really fun to do because you kind of revisit a lot of stuff that you really wanted to use. Okay, so for backgrounds, I'm just going to start with uh, just watercolor cardstock. This is distressed watercolor cardstock and I'm just going to pre-mist. I'm not sure if I want to use the smooth or the textured side right now, but I'll just mist a couple of those and I'm going to work over here on uh, the nonstick part of the media mat. Again, this is removable. Yes, I have a new one of those too that I just put on, right? Just because I wanted to treat myself. I wanted to make a nice little space. So remember, if you have a media mat, like you can, I keep replacements in my studio because I'm pretty rough on these, all right? But by starting with a little bit of, of a wet surface, that's going to allow, especially if you're spraying, uh, it just makes for more movement right away. If you start on dry paper, that's okay, but you are going to get more of like the bullseye area of where you, where you sprayed. Okay. So I'll just put another one down, just kind of utilize uh, this area. We're going to use a little bit of villainous villainous. If you, if you haven't used it yet, it's a, it's a pretty intense color. So a little goes a long way, but it's, it's such a great uh, playful <laughs> blend color, if you will. This one's gonna need a little ice. So each time I, I pick up the, the mica stain, I just wanna give it a little spray. See, look, that's gonna make it nice and moody. Okay, let's take a little bit of this one. Yeah, I don't even think I need hickory smoke for this. I think this is good. One is gonna be a little bit more uh, bright winter. One is a little solid. So here's what we've got so far, right? Watercolor cardstock, mix it with water, a few stains, a few mica. And then I'm going to want to blend it a little bit before I start to dry it just because so instead of taking my sprayer and misting it like that, I'm just going to slowly squeeze the trigger. Can you guys see how it does that little splatter? That's what I want to create on these backgrounds. So you'll see by splattering, you see what the ink is doing. So I'm not hosing it down, but by splattering that it's just providing more movement on that specific area. Now you can leave it like this. If you want to move the color, you can simply tip your background. All right, look at that, nice fluid movement. And I'm not gonna clean anything up yet because I wanna go into that. But because I've sprayed there, now I can move it over to this part of the media mat to start drying. Where is my inky binky? There we go. I got my ink towel here, all right? That's what I use to, to wipe off. But I'm gonna leave this stuff for now and then I'll start drying. Um, I like to move over to a dry space to dry because I think that my cardstock dries quicker, right? If you try to dry in here, not only are you picking up some of this most likely, but also you're drying that ink that you may wanna go back and use, okay? Here we go. And don't be afraid to pick up your paper. Give it movement. Ink will wash off your hands. If not, if you don't like that, just you can wear some gloves, but, but just moving your paper is what's going to allow that ink to, to play. And because we started with some slightly wet paper, okay? That's what is giving such a beautiful blend immediately. Now I'm on the textured side. I've saved these just to show you the difference of the smooth side because you might do different paper. And I think I might even go to white heavy stock for the next one just to show you smoothie stuff, okay? So when I dry layers, I use a, a craft tool. I love to use a heat tool over an embossing gun because I don't want my stuff to look like spin art at this point, but I don't dry everything crispy. You can still see that it, there's st still some wet areas. There's still some ink there, but this is what's going to allow me to play in this. Now, a couple things to note, you know your palette. You did it, you sprayed it. So I know right there what that color is. That's villainous. So I know that if I go into that big giant splotch of purple, it's gonna be a big splotch of purple. I don't want that. So there's nothing wrong with editing your palette, right? Which means you can just take a, a paper towel or something and anything big that you don't want, just remove it. See, that would have been a lot of villainous on any background. It would have just overpowered everything, okay? The other thing is I like to just take my fingers and go through this background 
because that's going to break up that mist and give me different size droplets. And that's if you're a droplet person. You may not be a, a droplet person, but I, I am. I like that. So now I'm going to take this and I'm going to go into some of that uh, purple and brown, but I'm just going to dab. So I'm going to take one edge, take the other edge and see how I'm like, it's almost like if you're swatting, like swatting something. So I'm not pressing. I don't want to make full contact. I just want to splash in the puddles. See what I'm getting? Great different ink spots. Every time we do some type of layer, if you will, we want to dry that. Okay. Look at those. So far, so good. Let's dry this layer. And so see, by just taking my fingers and dragging through it, I just created bigger droplets that would not have appeared. It would have all been like misty. Okay. There we are. Ooh, villainous. Oh, rocks. Villainous. I'm glad you like it. It's so good. So, so good. All right. Beautiful, beautiful. But see, by having smaller pieces of paper, see how you can just have some holiday tunes, cranking, whatever, and just ink to your heart. You're not thinking. You're not overthinking the ink. You've got little pieces of paper cut and ready to go. That's why to me this size is great. It's excellent for die cutting and it does make great gift tags, small cards. Who says that you have to do um, regulation size cards every time, right? And who says that if you have a, a regular card, and I'll just say like an A2, four and a quarter, five and a half, that you can't use a small background on there. Of course it is, it's plenty of room to create that background. You can even use it that way on your card, trim the edge and then put a sentiment. So your background doesn't have to be the entire piece of card. Play around with what it is that you like. So here's my next layer. I've dried, look at that mica stain coming through, that little shine, look at that villainous under there. Here I wanted to keep this one more blue so we've got a little villainous on the edge, but see how villainous is starting to take on a little bit of sheen, why? Because part of this mix has some mica stain. So once mica stain is there with distress stain, it'll start to give a little bit of a glow to anything that's, that's down there, okay? So because to me, this is looking a little dry, if you will, right? Everything is pretty dark and intense. I'm gonna go in with some more water. Now, distress is reactive with water, which means when you saw when I sprayed water, the color got more intense. We want that, I wanted that. So I'm gonna break that up one more time because I wanna create bigger droplets. I don't want anything too tiny. Now this, because there's water, is just gonna give me a different kind of movement on this particular background. And I like to just change direction of my paper. Take a look at that. Ooh, see, I love that. See that little drippage line going on? Mm, that's a good one, okay? So here I'm gonna stay a little bit more in this vicinity. There's a little less villainous down here, okay? Look at that. So this one, because we added the water, you see how instead of everything being all fleckily speckly, you're getting a little bit more of a fluid break you can do what you want. If you want everything to be polka dots, go for it, right? If you want something that's gonna have a little bit more fluid movement, you can do that too. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, you can line up strip. There's so many different things that you can do for a small paper and hopefully that's what this demo is just gonna uh, kind of spark for that making. I think sometimes we just get so caught up with, with what we maybe see all the time and it's like, okay, I've gotta do this. Oh, I've gotta do this. Oh, I always have to work on a big, that's a big commitment. It's, I mean, it's a piece of paper. And for people that are art journaling right now, they're rolling their eyes. They're like, big commitment. We work in a journal. But see, if that's what you're used to, then that's what you should do. Okay? So I've dried this layer, but now I want to add some, a little bit more depth. So here you can see I love the movement that's going on. I'm good with what's over here. Now I'm going to take my spray bottle. I'm going to do that same drip thing, but just with water and just directly on these backgrounds. So I'm creating those droplets. I'm not misting. Just going with droplets. That's what's cool about this sprayer is that you can get that mist, but you can also just by slowly squeezing it, it is designed. I loved, <laughs> I love the sprayer. It's got great droplets. Now, a couple of things. If I dry these droplets for a few seconds, it is going to give me a deeper or more intense outline of my drops than if I don't. Okay. Then we can take a towel. You can take your ink cloth, whatever it is you want to do. And we're just going to dab over the background. Okay. So all this did was it just started to lift it. So see these light spots? That's what the water did. But do you see how dark the outline is? That's what the heat did. Because when the water hits distress, it wants to wick. That's when we talk about it being reactive. It's literally moving away from itself. That's different than when you say inks are water reactive and they just kind of move. Well, water-based inks, of course, are going to react with water. But something that wicks that actually creates movement 
is what's going to give you these cool outline effects. The longer you dry it, the more intense your outline is. The less you dry it, the more muted that outline is. And if you don't dry it, you won't get any outline. You'll just get more of almost like a, a bokeh effect, if you will. Just something with a little light source, all right? So these two backgrounds, great fun. Great fun, love that. These aren't crispy dry, but they're dry enough for me to go in and I would throw them in the tin, which I will. So now I've got these. I think I told you I was gonna work with um, some white heavy stock. Let me grab that. I have some, see? We were putting that mini trimmer to, to the test last night. We were firing it up. Uh, it was fun. It was so fun to like, I mean, I, I use all the trimmers, but just having something where you're like, I don't know. Mario was saying it's kind of like in the kitchen, you know, where you have like a, a regular, like a big knife that you're going yeah. in and slicing, and then you have a smaller knife where you're just like, ch -ch 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 -ch, like you're just chopping away. Different tools for different things. Yeah, so it was like, I go, this little trimmer, like I didn't think I would be chopping so many things. All right, so this one is uh, white heavy stock. Again, could you use the back of watercolor paper? Sure. This one I'm gonna just start dry and I'm gonna go into the same stuff and just see what I get, right? Just wanna make my first print. So this time I'm actually pressing. Now when you press, you're probably gonna get a little bit of a fingerprint mark, right? Depending on how hard you press, that's gonna be okay. But if you don't want any mark, then well, don't press on it. Okay, we're gonna dry this. These are nice because sometimes you want something that's gonna be a little bit more subtle or a little bit wispy. But this paper, of course, is gonna take the ink different right just different but beautiful nonetheless okay first layer dry not crispy but dry right meaning i have no fluid movement in the middle going back into my palette look at there's a little bit of blue just saying pick me yeah and splash 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 flip it over oh look at that going in so let's say you do this and you don't like this you see this little splash right kind of like a squash bug you hit it and then you get uh, little droplets remember this ink is always reactive with water so if you went in and sprayed this right now that is going to minimize the intensity of those splats see how it just kind of wick them out always keep that in mind so even if you're judging your splatter don't judge too much but even if you're looking at it, you're like oh yeah it's a little smaller than what i'm going for Hit it with a little water before you dry it and that'll just feather it right out. Simple, 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 okay? And drying in between layers, well, that is that is key, always. That is critical to go in. And also your movement. You don't wanna drag this through. That's gonna create just a, a whole different whole different aesthetic that we don't want. I'm gonna add some water. So you just wanna, I wanna pull this down because I want, well, I just want a different movement on the paper. All right. So at this point, I love the colors. I love that I can still pick up some villainous. I can still see some blues. I can still see some ice spruce, but it's starting to look a little gray, a little muddy, and that's okay. Um, but I think I'm done with that color palette because I think if you just keep going into it, it's just gonna be mucky, mucky. So at some point you just have to call it. Again, when you're cleaning off this, start on the mat and end off the mat. Start, dismount. Don't start on the glass and go to the mat. So I'm starting on the mat, 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 off the mat, got it? That's gonna keep you from shoving ink underneath your mat. If you clean it this way, back and forth, and you're going off the edge, you're taking any ink, any medium, and you're essentially shoving it into that fabric, because this is still a fabric. It's not gonna damage it, but it, it does make the thing start to roll and curl, and that just, that just is, just is what it is. All right. Okay, so this background, beautiful. Quite beautiful, look at that. See, look at that little bit of mica stain in there, that little bit of villainous going in. These are gonna be great to use, say, uh, an impresslet, right? That snowflake and create a snowflake background. Yeah, I really like that. This cardstock, again, because it is smooth, is definitely more of a fluidy background uh, than even watercolor, right? Watercolor is even gonna be more porous, but not bad for, for a generation, especially after we printed in both of these. Right, quite cool, quite fun. Let's keep going with some, some other backgrounds. So this one I'll take, do a little bit of, of watercolor. I'm gonna take some of this, good, good, good. I love a little holly branch. We're gonna do a little tree lot. And this one we're gonna throw in some oxide on this one, just so you can see when we add oxide to our background because oxide is gonna be that fusion of dye and pigment. 
it's going to get a little bit uh, of a creamy, dreamy look, which uh, quite honestly, I like. Okay. So on this one, I'm going to work on the smooth side of the watercolor paper. Distressed Watercolor Cardstock has a textured side, a smooth side. They both work. Uh, just one is textured. And obviously the mica sits into those little pits. So you can see the texture of the mica stain. If you don't want that, then work on the smooth side, which is what I'm going to show you on this one. Okay. So essentially start the same, just give it a quick little mist. We're going to start out with just our, our mica stain. And just to add that a couple of colors, you can tell I don't like to put the tops on right away because you never really know. And I don't need much. I'm not hosing it down. I want to really work from uh, the negative space, but also this overspray is still ink. So if you sometimes saturate a paper too much, um, you lose the, the balance or the play of that. I'm going to add a little bit of water. Just create a little bit of a little bit of movement right there. Okay. So see these drips? I'm not a fan of those. So I'm just going to go right into this and that's going to fill that in. All right. So there's nothing wrong with, especially if you're just using uh, two colors like that. Ooh, see, I like that. I like how the, that mic has shifted right there. Then I'll go in and dry. Plus I like what it, what's created over here. Yeah. You just kind of get to play around, uh, when you're working in things. And this is still going to dry with different colors, right? Don't be fooled by the fact that you use two greens and you're like, green on green is green. Denied. No. Nope. Green on green, if you have different colors, is going to be magic. Beautiful. See, look at, oh my heck. Holly branch and tree lot for the wind, guys. Look what's going on here, right? So you can see here that holly branch just has a little bit more of that yellow and see tree lot is that deeper green. But see how the, even the, the difference in mica, that deeper green versus more of that golden green, not bad for a first layer, right? Not bad at all. Okay. I'm going to add a few little water drips to this. I'm going to take some oxide. Now, when I go on oxide, I want to find a clean spot of my mat. I don't want to go through the ink that's here, right? So I'll just pick these corners. I can put it in two opposite corners. And what I'm doing is I'm pressing down. So you can see my finger change color. I'm not just swiping it. You have to press ink down to get ink out of a pad. All right, some people think an ink pad's dry because they just touch it to a surface and it doesn't ooze. There are inks designed like that. A lot of new hybrid ink pads uh, that are foam based, they're very juicy. They're designed to deliver a significant amount of ink. Uh, and again, if, if that's your thing, that's what those are for. And add a little bit more water. So here I've got oxide that I added water but we've got that square. So what's going to happen if I put this in that square and it's going to stamp a nice square. So we have the technology, right? Just take your fingers and just move that around. Just use your palette. You really become kind of the artist there. Now these drips, what that's going to do is that's going to make that whatever I touch almost bloom or become fluid into my background. This again, we're still just going to swat a little bit and we're going to start drying. So here that's the introduction of oxide. Right? See that little creamy white look because we're getting a little bit of dye and pigment. It's just going to give your background a little bit more interest. Quite beautiful though. I love the, the look of, of adding layers. And this is just something, honestly, guys, you could just play all the time. I love to add water just to, to get things to, to wick a little bit more. There you go. Okay, so I'm going to show you what's happening here because we've added some oxide onto the ink, onto the mica, what it can and can't do. Okay, so there's a layer. So oxide, because it's a dye and pigment, pigment always dominates dye. And what that means is that anytime you have a pigment, whether it's an oxide or even a pigment ink for that matter, or paint, it is always going to rise to the surface, which means it will sit on the top. So even if you add, let's just say you added a layer of ink to the, the top of this right now, when you add water to it, that oxide is always going to transfer to the top. And I love the fact that because of that, it really plays well on top of that mica stain. So see how the mica stain is there? You still get that shimmer, but then when the light hits it the other way, you're getting the opacity of the oxide. So it's quite cool. You don't lose anything that way. You're not losing any of the effect. It's just going to be a layer at this point. So now I'm going to go in, add a little bit more water there, and let's just go in and add another layer. This time I'm going full on splash mode. See, cause I wanted to break that up. I wanted to get more color, uh, less polka dot. And that just has to do with, with how much you, you go in and, and play. 
and I'm just going to dry this one. But this one's not going to be crispy dry. I'm going to set this one off to the side because I, I got some plans over here. I'm going to go in, same thing, watercolor going on the smooth side. And we're just going to go all in for this one. Now I'm, I'm dancing around to the oxide, to the stain, but I'm still pressing. I'm not like dragging it through because I want to create just more of a modeled effect on this. See what we get. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. It's that simple. This one, of course, is going to be much more overall softer. Why? Because by going into the oxide and mixing it with the stain, the pigment will dominate the dye. So instead of the pigment being an accent because we just tapped into it, it will essentially kind of soften everything there. But what you're still going to see, can you, can you still see the mica? You're still seeing that mica because the mica is also a pigment. So it's like pigment on pigment. It's like bring it on. But mica is full on pigment. So it will always uh, remain on the top. This one's cool. This is like oxidized. This is going to be beautiful uh, for some holly leaves or a tree or gosh, something like that. Isn't that a cool background? Yeah. I love the depth of it because it's got some shimmer. It's got some opacity to it. See, just a fun background. Let's throw over there. This one, let's see what we build. I'm going to go in here a little bit. Let's see what other... What other ingredients do I have off to the side? Oh, I've got a good old peel of paint. Oh, I've got some rustic. Rustic means business. Like rustic is to green what villainous is to purple. <laughs> it means some business. So this is just a spray stain. That's going to be pretty intense. Um, I think what I'm going to do is just give it a little, little splatter, right? So I'm kind of off camera, just holding it back and just giving it just a little splatter of that. Can you see? Okay, but they're not going to stay like that. It's just how much I want to put in. Now I'm just going to wet it just to kind of get that movement. There we go. You look at the introduction of that color. Oof. Now we're talking. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful. This is just showing you how you can go in uh, and add some colors. And we're going to do a little crayon as well. A little crayon action to this background. Just drying. Now I'm going to go in. Now because I sprayed over here, I still get to use the rest of that overspray of rustic right see those little dark green dots that's the beauty of once you understand a media mat honestly it, it took me a while to just figure out how to how to really use it it is such a great tool because i'm like working and drying it's like clean space and like that wet palette that always stays there uh, and you just get to do so much more with your product if you just remember like don't just work in the middle of it because that's what you're used to that is really for the the glues, the, the inks, the paints, the stuff that you want to uh, kind of play around with, but then you always have that dry space, that safe space in the middle to create. Oh, see, I'm loving this. Really, really nice. Okay. Yeah. And Rustic Wilderness, you can see just how it really created that deep, deep uh, color. Pretty similar to Tree Lot. Tree Lot Mica Stain has uh, some Rustic in it. This is Tree Lot's a little blend of Rustic uh, and forest moss actually. So, cause you can see like, you see how dark that was in the mica stain. See how that's actually darker than rustic. Why is it so dark? Because it's really rustic, which is a dark green, but then forest moss, which is really, really uh, deep because all the mica stains are blends of existing colors. Now, speaking of that, because uh, I've had a, a few people ask, so the mica stains and the crayons are, the seasonal release from Ranger this year. So again, a shout out to Ranger, shout out to all the brands really for pulling off a seasonal release during the middle of, you know, basically not getting product anywhere. Um, but the mica stains, and I know there's many retailers that still have it. I've, I've talked about this before. You can check it out on the blog, but between Halloween and Christmas, we have a full rainbow of mica stain and crayons. We have a full palette. Ranger has agreed to do a seasonal launch next year, which I'm really excited about. Uh, of doing more mica stains and crayons, but I will not be repeating these colors. I will be doing new colors next year. Uh, so that's just important to know. And I've already had this conversation. Paul's like, so what do you mean? No flickering candle next year? I'm like, no, no flickering candle next year. Uh, there'll be other colors, but that's a thing. So depending on how you, you know, how you use them or how many you have of them, it'll be nice because we're essentially going to hopefully double the palette next year and have new colors 
to work with. And so if you have these existing ones, it's just going to be nice. But yeah, these will not be coming back next year. It's More good. New colors. I love That's that. Awesome. Well, I just I think it's great that we're doing seasonal. And yeah, they're like, you want to do those colors again? I'm like, no, let's let, let's do something a little different. Right. And I know I'll probably regret that decision next year when I run out of something and be like, oh, my gosh, you know, how do I not have any holly branch? But it is what it is. I'll be able to, as you can see from this demo, you can still mix some of your distress spray stains and oxides and even ink pads into that. Look at that background. Right. That was that really kind of wet, mucky one. Totally different effect. Right. Getting the intensity. Why is this one more uh, intense color wise? Because that one started with more dye, less oxide. Why is this kind of all over muted? Because that's where the oxide mixed in. But I do think that that rustic wilderness really added uh, the depth that I thought this background needed. All right. Let's get into some other colors, some other little background pieces. It is good to know. Right. Really. Uh, I love I just love playing around. Let me do a little winterberry. That's still a little peppermint. So if you wanted to create a, a background, could you create a background with crayon? You could. And I've, you know, I've seen some people say, OK, uh, how would you work with with crayons? Well, you could still scribble your crayon right onto your craft mat. You can still wet it. Right. It's still going to turn into fluid because it's water reactive and it's still going to have some mica and you can go in and create a print. This is just going to give you a, a little different look see it's not as fluid it is a, a crayon my hands are a little green but it's okay but it's a cool it's a cool effect if you ever want to add just an accent of color i'm not going to say it's my favorite way to use crayons but it is still a cool way if you ever want to add just an accent usually i would do this over a, a card that you would already have okay but that's the the beauty of crayons as well they are water reactive so just because they're in a stick doesn't mean you always have to color directly. Sure, you can, right? You can color and smudge and do all that. But to take some of these colors, it is very cool. I'm going to throw in a little winterberry because I like that color. Okay. We can scribble that on there, spray it. Now, they're water reactive, but, but unlike, say, a gelato that's going to move when it wets, you have to actually move these. Okay. They're just designed to, well, to be different. They're, they're not the same. They're designed to be uh, more stable on, on a water-based background because you could color them over something inked. You could still then spray that ink that's behind it and the crayon won't react unless you touch it, unless you move it. So I like the stability, but I'm just gonna show you uh, how cool these are because we're dealing just with a pigment. They, they, I don't know, it's almost like soap suds. You'll see what I mean in a second. It's pretty cool. Okay, whoa. Look at this. It's bubbly. So look at that background. So see how this background. So you have a much more subtle look because we're not dealing with full on mica stain. We're dealing with the mica crayon, but you still get that shimmer. But you see how much more depth you're getting. And even that like that's dry. So it has, like I said, more of a bubbly. I don't want to say encaustic because I don't think it's too encaustic, but it flows different than an ink spray would, but creates a cool background. So this background could go onto something like you could already have a background of a color and you can you can add the crayon. But it just depends on what your background color is and how it's going to react with that. But a very fun, quick way to do a background and even pieces like this pieces where it's like, hmm, what if like let me play around with this, save it. Even if you have an ink spot, this could be trimmed and now you have a background to stamp on. Right. Maybe you're going to die cut something out of this, like whatever it is. You don't always have to finish a piece of paper edge to edge. This is just about you doing you and having fun. You really need to just not think about things on the mat, off the mat, on the mat, dismount, right? Never from the glass. Now let's work with the sprays. Let's do that. I think on this one, I'm going to go to craft. Let's play around with some craft a little bit. Now craft is going to be different because it's going to be more porous. Okay. So it's not going to give you as much as much play, but it's still going to give us some play. Okay. And we're going to get more into like stamps and stencils uh, and what to do even with sprays and inks with stamps and stencils, but that's going to be uh, on week three. So this one is just like backgrounds without tools, but trust me, I'll show you how we can work with stencils and how we can do mono printing and we can do all sorts of different things that, uh, that we can work with. All right. That's right, Judy. Don't 
think when you ink. That's what I say. Don't overthink the ink. You just kind of go for it. All right. So here we've got some some red and some pink. So winterberry and peppermint stick. Because we're going to work on craft, we're still going to get the ability uh, of having some color from the stain itself. That's what I love about uh, the stain. But we're really going to see much more of the intensity of the shimmer of mica because our cardstock is starting out darker. Okay. Beautiful. Love, love, love this. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay. Nice. Look what's happening when it's drying. Look at that. So we're right now this one is just about embracing the spray pattern. I didn't I didn't wet the paper first. I didn't add water to this afterwards. I just kind of go for it. Turn it into a poinsettia. You're darn right. Absolutely. It is about just having fun. Beautiful. All right. Oh, Susan said I didn't use my splat box. Oh no, I'll get there. But this is because I didn't want to use a splat box because for this, I want to show you what you can use with the leftovers. But I will talk about the splat box. And trust me, it's going to get, it's definitely going to get used. So here's what we've got on craft. What's cool about craft is you see the color of the stain, but then you really see kind of the blowout of the mica when it, when it turns. A nice way that again becomes a cool background. Definitely great when you ink it with distress ink or oxide. We're going to get into talking about stamping and stuff again when, and I'll be stamping on a lot of these backgrounds too. So the pieces that I'm doing like now will show up again later on in the month just to say, okay, well, what do you do with this? Well, we we're probably going to die cut it or stamp on it. I'm just showing that when you're in the making mode, spend more time creating and playing than assembling start to finish, especially this early stage of the season. It's better to prepare I mean, just look at just the fun stuff that we've created so far. It's better just to sit and play and prepare. And this is only two mediums, right? Normally I'd have alcohol inks out and I'd have all sorts of things, but there's a lot of videos on uh, my website already for that. So if you really wanna get more in depth into uh, what to do with, with alcohol ink and what can I do uh, more with stamp pads and spray stain, definitely check out my website. Go in and just search any of those products in the search feature and you'll be able to see that. Okay, that's going to be really important to, to just kind of refresh your memory. That's the key about this is if you I think if you spend more time just playing and seeing for yourself, you understand it way more. So here's what that second layer did just of that same stain. See how it just gave me more of that ripply effect. That's good. That will be great for a poinsettia. Now, could I add uh, a crayon over the top? Like, could I do scribble a crayon? Sure. Could I color with crayon directly on the top? Yes, you can do that, too many, many options of, of when you're playing. And usually I'll be honest when I'm in kind of ink mode, um, I'll start working with very similar colors and I don't necessarily clean up in between, uh, every time. All right. Okay. So let's get into real quick, just some quick kind of water coloring. If you're going to uh, sit down and you have a bunch of stamped imagery and I won't get into that right now, but a lot of times I'll just sit there, I'll have my card pre-cut and then I'll go in and stamp. Usually if I'm going to do that, I'll stamp with archival and I'm going to get into some really cool stamping techniques uh, on week three. But if you just want to do some quick coloring, you can pre stamp these in something waterproof. doesn't have to be archival. You just want to make sure that whatever you use is waterproof. Uh, this is just my, my favorite to work with. And then you can go in and color and you can do a couple of ways. If I'm coloring, this is where I will have all my stuff stamped. I'll kind of get into color mode and I will peel this off. Right. This is just a silicone backing. So you can set that somewhere, you can wash it, whatever. And I'll work from my palette. The nice thing about working with the palette is I can create a palette with crayons if I want. Right. Just actually scribbling on um, the mica crayons. Those are going to give you more of the shimmer. If you want, let's just take this out, take this tin just to show you the difference. If you're going to create a palette, you can kind of create it in, you know, rainbow order. If you're going to work with a bunch of uh, different colors, so maybe I want some ripe persimmon. So a distressed crayon, especially the longer you have it, become a little bit more, I don't know, dense or firm. And they're really nice because they transfer to the glass. You can see how much more, let me get rid of that shadow. There you go. See how much more intense they are? Because these are just the regular crayons. They don't have any, any mica. 
The mica crayons, they're, they're kind of a blend between the color and some of the pearl where the regular crayons are just full on color. So I would create a palette, again, with whatever medium you want. If you're not working with crayons, maybe your medium of choice, let me take these out hopefully without going all tumbling here. Maybe it's going to be ink pads, right? The mini cubes are sized specifically for that little square. So you can press that down. Remember we want to press, give a little twist, and then you've got ink there. So you can create whatever palette of mediums. And if you're doing color, say, maybe you're gonna spend a few nights doing coloring, right? Night after night. Then what you're going to do is just create the palette and leave it. You don't have to clean it off at night. That medium is never going to dry on this glass, never, okay? So you can put it away as long as you don't set something on top of it. You can get this out each night and say, okay, especially like on the travel one, cause it has a small palette. You can go in and say, all right, I'm going to sit there and, you know, I've got all my stuff stamped. I've, I'm ready to sit there and color it. Each night you just bring this out and your palette is already there. And the beauty of that is, you know, when you're ready, you can clean it off with water. You can refresh your palette, but that's really nice. Or you can do re-inkers in a palette. There's many other ways that you can create a palette. Would you mind grabbing the ink palette? It's in the top drawer right there just to, to show people. But let's just, let's just pretend that it was stamping. I don't want to get day one to be too confusing. I just want to give you some ideas of why you would want to put these mediums in your cart. That's the purpose of today. Um, there's a crayon one. Can you get the inker one too, please? Of why you would want to put that in. Because if you don't see a purpose for it, you might sit there and say, um, oh yeah, I, I wouldn't need that. I wouldn't use my minis. I don't, I don't plan on doing this. I just do backgrounds. This is a great way to color because if I had a stamped image and you can take a water brush or whatever it is you're creating, um, you can go in Francine. I'll answer that question in one second. She's asking if we could put it in a palette. You're one step ahead of me. I'll show you that. So here I can take watercolor paper, textured or smooth, and now I can either watercolor with the crayons, right? And that's gonna dry with a nice mica shimmer. Clean my brush. I normally clean in my palette area because I like to keep my brush wet. But you can also pick up some color and you can mix a color if you want. So maybe you are creating a, a poinsettia and you want something that's a little bit more, you know, intense, almost a, like a deep kind of a crimson color. You can mix, it's a little ripe persimmon mixed in there, right? Or if you're doing a background and you want to pick up ink, you know, look at that beauty of working with an ink pad. And that could be your color medium. And you could have just inks or just crayons or half and half. You do whatever's going to work with you. But the question was talking about the palette. And I've talked about this in demos as well. This is the ink palette. Now we have a distress ink palette and an alcohol ink palette. They're exactly the same. Ranger just has two versions because depending on where they are in the store, it just kind of gives uh, you as the maker permission to say, oh, is it safe with alcohol ink? Yes. Can I use it with distress? Yes. So both of those palettes are exactly the same, whether it's distress or alcohol ink branded. I have one for alcohol inks that are dry. This one is my re-inker palette. So this has distress and oxide re-inkers, depending on my color choice, right? I like that it's got a hinge clear lid. Some people like to label. If you're going to label, I recommend labeling on the inside when you open it. To match up here because if you label this part it's going to be insignificant when you actually do it unless you plan on popping off the lid each time so just note to self but you can see that my re-inkers have kind of they say almost gelled up if you will but not really they'll never dry and these re-inkers have been in there probably i'm going to say at least three years i don't do much coloring uh, with this i'm not a good colorer but i use it for demos so they'll never dry in here year after year after year uh, but they will thicken up so it is nice that you know you can take that and they don't drip out because they become more gelled but this color is super intense uh, the question about crayons yes i create a crayon palette as well you just take your crayons and you scribble them in there just scribble as much as you want and this is all going to be water reactive so if i want to pick up some color right I'm, you know i'm going to go right to brown because uh, that water brush or a paintbrush, look at that. It just turns it right into a uh, beautiful watercolor. Super intense. And you can just blend that out. So it is nice that you can make a palette. So this is someone that maybe you don't want to have a medium mat out. Maybe you'd rather just create a palette and you're ready to go. And it, when you're done with this, like if you want to start over, you can just put it in the sink, leave it there for a few minutes, and then just wash it and all this medium will come right out of it uh, if you use crayons or ink pads. So re-inkers, and I know um, Christina Warner, she does a lot of watercoloring with re-inkers. There's many people that do. 
Uh, this one, to me, if you're gonna do a re-anchor palette, you need to know what you're doing, okay? And which I don't. Because re-anchor is a concentrated version of an ink pad, super concentrated. So one little touch of a brush into a color, like just the, the little tip of the water brush. I don't know if you could see that. There's like hardly anything there. There's so much color that is going to come off of that. It's just that intense. This happens to be wilted violet. But you really get a beautiful, beautiful blend with a re-inker because you are always going. So this is an ink pad and you can see that pretty much it's the, it's the same color. Although yes, you can, you can get it to blend a little bit. I mean, you could add some water and obviously get it to blend out, right? But it's pretty much the same color. A re inker because it's concentrated, it really gives you that wonderful ability to create such cool, intense colors that you can do. So when you're working with that, again, you just print out your labels. Ranger has them on their website. Go to organized products at the bottom, print out the label sheet, use a circle punch, peel and stick, and off you go. So you can have that as well. I've seen some people even going with the Sharpie. If you have good handwriting, you can uh, do Sharpie and you can actually write on the base plastic but you, uh, that, you gotta have a really delicate hand for that, all right? So that's just different ways that you can do your coloring, working on the palette, having a palette, whatever it is that you're, you're creating, and you just wanna work with what you want. Some people work with paint brushes. I happen to love the Distress Water Brush just because uh, it has a very detailed tip. It's self-feeding, and that's just what I use. But you have to use what works for you, right? Some people don't want to have this set up because they're like, Tim, I'm not going to do a lot of coloring during the making season. I'm going to really do backgrounds. Okay, well then maybe this is going to be your jam. Now, do you have to have it with all the same medium? Gosh, no. I mean, if you look at it, it's a quadrant. You could have crayons in one. If you've got a few reinkers, if you have some oxide, you could have one palette for different mediums. It's all about you. I think that's, it's so important to remember as makers, right? You can see all these videos and demos and this is what Tim does and this is what so-and-so does. That's all great. You need to do you. You need to do what actually works for you in the colors that work for you that you're gonna like and that you're actually going to use uh, more than anything. So I'm just cleaning this area, cleaning it really well. I normally like to go in with a paper towel on that just to make sure that it is clean before I Put the mat back on top of it okay because anything that's left underneath is going to to transfer so i just place that back down there we go good a little water on top it's going to clean but it's also just going to and i'm working from the center out just kind of push it it's got fabric so it could fray on the edge don't worry about it no big deal some people don't like the bubbles if you don't like the bubbles you can get a craft scraper and kind of work out the bubbles i enjoy them Okay, how we do? So far so good, right? Different backgrounds. Okay, I'm gonna show you one other thing for a quick background idea, and then uh, we'll see if there's any specific questions to, to wrap this up. So let's just say you, you don't like to layer, right? Maybe something like this is just too much, right? Where you take that and you think, okay, adding all those layers, is, it's just a lot of work, and I'm still not comfortable with, with which colors to choose and how to, to build up layers. You can still do some very beautiful backgrounds uh, using a brayer, okay? And I'll demo some other things uh, with a brayer. This is the Distress Brayer. It is a, it is a special black rubber brayer. It's not too hard, and, but it's not also squishy um, like, say, a speedball brayer. It's just kind of in between, but it is designed to hold Distress mediums. And I've done an entire video on just the brayer. If you don't like this brayer, use what you have, use what you like. Um, but it comes in two sizes, right? A medium size, a little sports car size, just depends on uh, what it is you're gonna create. But I'll just take a bit of watercolor and maybe I just wanna do a background. Now, could we go in with our ink pads? Sure we could, we could do that. We could, we could take a, an ink pad itself that we want to, to have and we could pick up color on that. So if that's just your thing, you could just go in. You're always gonna roll and lift. Okay, you're never just gonna go roll back and forth. It's only gonna ink up half of your brayer. You wanna roll and lift so you can coat the roller and just set your finger as a, as a stop guide. It's pretty simple, okay? Now, if you put it just on regular dry paper, okay, you're going to get a, a dry effect, but you could still blend with an oxide. I mean, you could brayer it out uh, pretty well. That's not a problem, okay? You can do a, a lot of different things with, with working with with that, okay? 
that's not too impressive to me. But maybe that's your thing. And maybe you're going to go in and do layers or maybe you're going to do gel print. You're going to do whatever. But you can take that same idea. Again, I'll go back to watercolor paper. Now, it doesn't have to be an oxide pad. It could be a regular distress pad. It could be anything. We're just going to ink this up. Okay. And I definitely like doing this with, with even stain. And I'll show you that. So if I take the same brayer, but now I just mist my paper with water, then I know that when I go in with this ink, it's just going to start reacting on contact. Okay. And that's just going to give me a nice, cool blend. Just very, very simple, taking one color, but see, because we're rolling it on, it's going to pick up in different tones, different areas. It's also going to pick up every inky finger. And that just gets me started on an entire game. But it's a really simple way to do a background like that. So if you just want to do some really quick backgrounds, play around with the brayer, okay? But there's other ways that we can use the brayer that I think are, are entertaining, if you will. Uh, pretty fun to work with. Let me clean this off. So to clean a brayer, you have a couple of options. One, you can uh, just go in with a towel and just roll and roll and roll or go on paper. Or this brayer is designed that if you grab the roller, right? take your finger and just pull this apart. These handles are designed to come apart. Then it's just easier to wipe off completely. You can, if you're using it for glue, you can take it under the sink and then you just insert a peg. So the handle is made of wire that's designed to separate, but it keeps your brayer uh, moving. So it just depends on how messy you want to get. But let's say we wanted to create just a, a cool background that was, I don't know, maybe, maybe snowy. Okay. We'll take some snow flurries and I think I'll even take a, a little frosted juniper. I'm going to take a spray and spray it onto my mat. Okay. Just a few colors right on top of each, each other. That's fine. This time I think, uh, what, do I, what did I grab? Oh, okay. I grabbed white heavy stock. I grabbed a smooth cardstock. We're going to take the brayer and we're just going to gently roll and lift. Okay. We're getting the ink to coat the rollers in drips. It's really important to understand that. And I'll show you what not to do after I, after I do this, but I've got the color here. Then what I can do is just take this and just roll down my paper. Start on one edge, usually the top, or if you want to roll from the top down or from the bottom up and just roll. You don't need to press down, right? You don't need to, you don't need to be a steamroller, but look at that. What a beautiful, icicly snowy background that we can put on there. If you don't like the drips, could you go over it a second time? Sure. Now, when you work with a brayer, it's got little feet, right? The feet are designed that when you, let's say we ink this up and then you need to get your paper. I could turn this over and nothing is going to touch the surface, right? My ink is still safe, but when you use it, the brakes have to be off. Okay. But you could go in and you could brayer it a second time. I happen to love the drips. So I'm good. So literally seconds for a background. So if you're thinking, I don't have time to do all that, that layering stuff, Holtz, that's not going to happen. Easy. Does it have to be white heavy stock? No, it could be whatever you want to use. Different papers are going to give you different effects. Could you try this technique wet? Sure. But I'll tell you what, what you're not going to achieve if you do it wet. If you do it wet, you're not going to get these deeper striations of lines because the ink is going to want to react right, right on contact. Look at that. That's just a, have that mica. Isn't that beautiful? I know it looks wet, but it isn't. It's such a cool background with a brayer. So you're just sitting there like eh, 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 eh. easy, easy. What not to do is let's say you had ink on your mat. When you go to ink up a brayer, I see so many people take a brayer and push so dang hard on it that their finger turns a color, right? Because you're pushing. Look where you're pushing the ink. You're pushing it right off the surface. You're not putting it on the roller. You've got one drop of ink because all you're doing is you're pressing too hard. What you want to do is just relax your hand and just roll through that ink back and forth. You can hear that the rollers just kind of spin. That's what's going to coat your brayer with all those little dots. That's what we want. We don't want this. Okay. <laughs> That's what's going to push it off. You may want to use that if you're trying to smooth paper or spread out adhesive. That actually is when you want to use the brayer like that. But for an inky technique, it's all about being like just super light handed and kind of going about uh, that background. And there's really, there's so many things that, that we can create 
when it comes to, to working with this. And I'll just show you one of the things. See, I could go for hours. I said to Mara, I'm like, please, like, quiet me down because I'll keep going and going and going and going, right? It's, your thing. it's my thing. It's what I love. I do love it. So I just sprayed some water because I've got mica on there. Just want to clean up. I love how nice they it cleans up. It holds so many mediums, guys. It's not all not all brayers are created equal. I didn't I didn't do a brayer because I needed a Tim Holtz brayer. I did a brayer because I want a brayer that's going to work with uh, distress the way I want it to. So there's some ice spruce. Oh, there's some pine needles. I don't really have the color I want for this technique, but I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to use a little ice spruce and a little frayed burlap. We're going to see if this works. This may or may not be texture enough, but I'm still going to try. Okay. And we'll take this little guy. There you go. Our little piece of paper. Now, sometimes when I'm working uh, on paper, because I'm, I want to brayer on this piece of paper. Okay. I'm going to actually brayer uh, a pattern. Maybe I might not. This could actually be a hot mess and you'll be able to, to see it and judge me. No, kidding. No judging. Right? No judging. No judging. Okay, I got to find my sticky grid. Have you seen it? I put it in a safe place when I was cleaning up, but I think my place was too safe. Have you seen it? There it is. I'm going to take a piece of this. Could you use masking tape? Yes. Washi tape? Yes. But I'm going to use a piece of sticky grid and I'm going to place this down just on my mat. It's not the ideal use because you do kind of, you do go through this stuff pretty quick if you use it this way. It's not meant to do it this way, but for right now, this is what we have. So this is what I'm going to use. Okay. And I'm just going to stick my background to it because what I want is I want a fully exposed background. I don't want tape and I don't want magnets or anything unless you plan on cutting that stuff off. Okay. In this case, I, I don't plan on doing that. Taking a brayer, taking an oxide pad or an ink pad, whatever you want, you do you. Roll and lift, 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 roll and lift. Now, I want some brown on here. Ooh, do I really want to go into that oxide pad with, with this ink? No, denied. So instead, I'm going to take my oxide and I'm going to create a palette of that color by smushing, but now I can take my brayer and because it's an ink pad, I'm able to just pick up some of that color. So see, now I have both colors without going through another ink pad. You ink it up with ink pad one and roll through ink pad two. So I've got a pretty inked brayer. Okay. I'm going to take a piece of wood grain cardstock, a little texture, and I'm just going to start from here from edge and I'm going to roll. Mm, this may not work. But I'm going to see, I'm just going to roll from start to finish. And now I'm going to take my brayer and I'm just going to repeat that pattern. Ooh, it did work. Nice. And create a print. So this really works with a nice stencil, but I wanted to see if it's going to work with a cardstock. But see how you're able to just create a nice smooth pattern on the background? Love that effect. Now you also have this, right? So this is something that that I can take my brayer, I can finish inking up this whole sheet because this is just texture cardstock, but I would probably use this piece to ink, roll off, ink, roll off. And then there's many ways that we can work with this piece of paper. We could spray this with water because it's going to be reactive and that's going to still get all that stuff to, to blend. This one, let me peel off that sticky grid. I just love the, the subtlety of this. So this is kind of creating a wood grain texture on a completely smooth piece of paper. Okay. I kind of see that the brown striation that's from doing the second color. So maybe next time I'll probably maybe use a blending tool to put some brown down instead of directly from my ink pad, because I, I don't necessarily want these lines, but I think when this is cut off, it's going to be fine, but a, a very cool way that you can take a texture. So think about things you have, you can do this on an embossing folder. So let's say you have a, a Sizzix embossing folder with a cool pattern, ink up your brayer and you're just rolling over anything clean. It's basic mono printing, but there's a lot of things that as makers we have that you are rolling off. So what happens is we inked up and you can do this with paint. You can do this with ink. Usually something pigmented is a little bit better. And then you're just going to look at your brayer and you're going to start on a clean surface and roll until your pattern meets. 
and it, you're essentially transferring the ink onto a, an embossing thing. You can do plastic doilies. There's a million things that you can create um, back and forth. So when you use the brayer and roll it and lift to get the ink on, do you apply pressure to roll it off onto your background? Yes, Denise, good question. So the only time you don't apply pressure is when you are picking up a fluid right? When you're, when you're doing spray stain, that's when you're really light. But when you're inking up, you are, you can see my finger, you are applying pressure to ink up a brayer with ink pads or anything like that. It's just when you're trying to pick up a drop of something, you have to like carefully, like lightly roll over it. So that's fluid versus uh, pressure. So great question. So yeah, when you're transferring or brayering, it's, uh, it's pressure. Pretty fun. Happy that worked. There's a lot of ideas, right? So many different things that we can do to create soft backgrounds i love this drippy background and see that mica stain that's what i love about doing it you can do this with spray stain or even your ink pads if you get them wet enough but i love that the mica stain really creates some beautiful drips and and striations so hopefully hopefully this whole idea in fact i'm gonna i'm chopping this up there's another thing that i like to do hold on clean up holtz there's a little spray take this out Clean up your stuff. Don't be a messy maker, right? Clean that. Put it right back on my little hook. There you go. S hooks for the win. Okay, take this. Spray on, off, on, off. Over here, clean that with whatever's left. Perfect, perfect. Look at you go. Look at me go. All right, we've got these. They'll go back over here. These colors will go back here. Simple, see, all the ink pads, done. Sprays, done. That's another tip. When you are done with your making session, whether that is 30 minutes or an hour, put your stuff away, okay? That's the joy of having a cart, is you're not packing it up in the studio, but you're getting stuff away because if you have to go back and you have say 30 minutes the, the next time and you have to come back to an absolute pile of mess, you're not going to be creative. You're going to just be so discouraged that you're looking at so, so much garbage that you're not going to want to do anything, right? I think that's going to be the important thing. So it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean you have to be uh, completely, you know, scrubby but you do want to at least clean up the, the workspace. See, that took literally seconds. Now I can throw my, my little reconfigured tin. I like this because see, now I'll actually use my stuff because it's here, uh, because it's just in front of me. Uh, you do want to make sure that these are screwed on. Here's another tip. Uh, when you have something with a clear top, right? So let's just take these. Some people, they, they're in a habit of, uh, for whatever reason, twisting these off right? They give it that little twist motion. And when you do that, you often are untwisting, right? So you're untwisting your sprays. You can, st if you don't want to just pull the cap off, but you want to twist it, just twist away from you because then you're always going to be tightening your bottles. Just try to try to get into that new habit. So either pull this off or you're going to turn this. Oh, Ryan, glitter grin's greeting in the house. Hello, my friend. So yes, just give that a little twist sprays look at that what's up mario i see ryan in the house too he does yeah, he great here. videos great all right we're cleaning that off look at that clean space ready to work we've got all sorts of uh, different backgrounds so yeah i'm going to chop this one up because i like it and i know i'm going to use it so i'll just take that new little that new little mini look at that two great backgrounds to work with this one, see, if that's going to drive you crazy, here's a great way to get it to not. Just get rid of it. Look at that cute little tag. See, there's a lot of a lot of ways that we can oh, we can that's a good color since you're take the those. Tag down. I know it's <laughs> going to be perfect for tags. Tag tags. Yeah, I do. I love the fact that I can because a lot of times you just want short tags if it's a you know like a number eight. I like to just take the corner of the tag to the corner of the trimmer. And I just like that little squat tag. It's cute, right? Well, I'm going to make you a mayor it, tag Because it's more like a leather tag. Are you? Tag. Really? Yeah, oh, awesome. sure. Yeah. I can't wait. Like can't wait to see that. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Take out your tins. Now, obviously, I think I need to purge my tins. I need to go through and decide, you know, 
uh, if I'm not going to use some backgrounds, like maybe I'm not going to use that, I'll probably uh, get a tin just for some festive backgrounds. But I love the idea that I can take all of your your cut backgrounds, your pieces, if you're not going to zyron them, then you can just put them in the tin. I'm going to tuck these guys in the bottom, right? Because it's just nice. Those are my alcohol ink ones that I got out and put those back. A lot of fun, a lot of different ways that uh, that we can essentially be be organized for the holidays and have all of our fun little gadgety little cool tool 